the chanting will be done by Dr. Rajiv Kumar Cha. He is an associate professor in the department of Sanskrit, Shardiha College, Bakura. And here I will request Dr. Rajiv Kumar Cha to chant the Sanskrit sloka. Sir, please. Namo Nama. Namaskar. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Parama, Tasme Sri Gurave Namaha, Akanda Mandala Karam, Vyaptam Yena Characharam, Tatpadam darsitam yena tasme sri gurave nama Namaskar. Thank you, sir. Thanks for chanting the sloka from Sanskrit. Thank you, sir. And now we are going to the second technical session. And the first resource person is Professor Rup Kumar Bormon, and I will request Mr. Vinay Bormon to introduce Dr. Rup Kumar Bormon. Hello, Rupwati. Hello, good afternoon. I, I introduce Rukumar Burman. He is a professor of history and co-editor of Ambedkar Studies of Jadapur University. Thank you, sir. You will start your session. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate Shaldiha College for organizing this international e-conference on South Asian culture and heritage, uh, Indian influence on South Asian culture and heritage. Uh, I am grateful to the organizer, particularly Professor Binaya Barman, who has invited me to speak on this issue. And my uh, topic that I have decided to talk with you or share with you is the uh, historical legacy and contested citizenship in South Asia. This is the topic that I want to discuss with you within uh, just 10, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. First of all, I would like to share the fact that without citizenship in our contemporary world, we cannot think about the identity of a person in any part, any country of the world. Without citizenship, it is really very difficult to understand the test of human being. The citizenship is a legal status in a given time between a state and its people by which a citizen is considered to be the legal citizen uh, because, um, by the domestic laws or the uh, domestic rules and regulation of particular national state. At the same time, there are many people, those who may not be considered as the citizen of a particular country, those though they are living in a particular country for a long time. In case of South Asia, the two components of citizenship, like the uh, Jus Soli, the relationship of citizenship between the soil and the people, and the Jus Sanguinus, the relationship of blood. These are the two main components where we find these the citizenship acts of different countries are associated associated with in case of our south asian countries it is really very significant to understand the historical legacy because all these factors are closely associated with the citizenship act of the south asian countries like india bangladesh pakistan nepal bhutan sri lanka at the same time the neighboring countries of India, like Myanmar, like China, and Afghanistan, are also closely associated with the concept of citizenship 
of India as well as these countries. Now, what is the historical legacy in this particular South Asian context? Here we'll find the British colonialism or the West European colonialism as the main actor behind the historical relationship in regards to the citizenship problem of South Asian countries, including India, as well as its neighboring countries. It is well known that the Euro European, particularly West European countries, they established their colonial rule. I'm not going to repeat the history. And it is well known that the, gradually they emerged as the colonial ruler and they established the British Indian Empire starting from Pakistan to Bangladesh of present day and uh, later two or three colonies, they were, they were granted the status of crown colonies, particularly under the bright direct British rule, like crown colony of present day Myanmar or the, the crown colony of Burma, the crown colony of Sri Lanka. These emerged as the separate nation states in the post second world war period. But we cannot think, uh, we cannot deny the history of British colonialism or European colonialism in these countries of South Asia. So how did the European countries, they develop their colony? It is well known. But here you will find that the Brit with the rise of British Indian Empire, they, uh, India had established its close relationship with China in the north. And in the two northern countries of India, like uh, Nepal and Bhutan, they had also came under the direct influence of British Indian Empire, either from Calcutta or later from Delhi. Then in the uh, eastern side, Myanmar or Burma, that was a part of British Indian Empire up to 1935 that got separated by the British uh, in the Government of India Act of 19. 35 and from 1937 to 1947 it was a crown colony but we will find the close relationship between uh, these british indian empire and burma similarly in sri lanka we will find the same kind of relationship now this is the background what happened after the post second world war period in the post second world period that led to the growth of decolonization and rise of the several nation states in South Asia, including India and Pakistan, and later appeared the partition of Pakistan or the liberation war of Bangladesh that led to the emergence of a new nation state called Bangladesh. At the same time, Sri Lanka that got also independent nation state status, and uh, Bhutan that was a crowd that was basically a semi-colonial British Indian Empire, which was founded in 1907. Uh, onwards, the Shinge dynasty, who is still in power, had a close relationship with the British India, and after the independence, it became a friend of India. Nepal has a different kind of relationship. Nepal uh, and the people of Nepal are allowed to serve in India. They are allowed to come to India even without passport. Similarly, in Nepal, we can go without any kind of travel. So this is a historical background. And after 1947, we find the question of citizenship that became a serious problem in all these countries of South Asia. Let us think about India. The India, which uh, adopted its Citizenship Act in 1955. It is well known, which is called the Principal Act. And subsequently, we have found that this act has been uh, amended several times. And the latest one was in the Citizenship Amendment Act, CAA 19, 2019. And in between, here we will find the concept of the uh, infiltration, the concept of the illegal migrants of the neighboring countries. And that is a fact that after 1947, the people of uh, Pakistan, they were allowed to enter into India without passport. And uh, also they got the citizenship up to 1971. But the huge migration of people in Northeast India, particularly in Assam, had created a serious trouble that led to the development of a sentiment against the outsider that is called the expulsion of the foreigners or the Bideshi Kheda, and particularly from 1960s. And in the 1980s, it became a serious problem and that led to the adoption of a new uh, set of rules in the Principal Citizenship Act of India in 1985. And here we find the concept of the Asham Accord. 
and this Asham Accord led to the uh, amendment in the Indian Citizenship Act in 19, 1986. And onwards, and 2000, uh, 1992, then 2003, 2005, all these acts had amended as well as incorporated the different issues relating to the citizenship, those who entered into India from the neighboring countries. So here we find the historical legacy the people, those who are entering into India without valid document, how would be, how they would be treated in India? That became a serious issue in regards to their citizenship. Now, coming to the Pakistan, in case of, I'm discussing very briefly because of the shortage of time. Now, coming to the point of uh, Pakistan, here you will find that Pakistan and Bangladesh, which were emerged from the Deven Pakistan. Though Bangladesh, which was called the Eastern Bengal, and later it was named as East Pakistan from 1956 onwards to 1971. For these countries, Bangladesh and Pakistan, they had the uh, adopted the act called the PCA, Pakistan Citizenship Act in 1951. That is the principal act for Pakistan. This is the principal act for Bangladesh too. So Pakistan adopted the Citizenship Act before India and allowed the people, those who migrated from India to Pakistan uh, with valid reason, they were granted a citizenship Pakistan. But later on, it was found that huge migration from India to Pakistan had created a lot of problem and many of them were not granted the citizenship. They were identified as asylum seekers, muhajis or in different brands. At the same time in Bangladesh, before the emergence of Bangladesh in Eastern Pakistan, it was noticed that the migration that was continued to India and as well as from India to Eastern Pakistan, there was a kind of migration. But during the liberation war of Pakistan, Bangladesh in 1971, there was a serious trouble. A large number of people, they took shelter to India during the liberation war. And many of them had returned to Bangladesh after the emergence of Bangladesh. Many of them had settled in India. So those who returned to Bangladesh after the emergence of nation states, they were the granted citizenship in the PCA, where, sorry, when Bangladesh adopted the uh, act, just on the basis of PCA or Pakistan Citizenship Act, this is uh, nothing but a kind of uh, ordinance adapt, um, that was issued in 1972. So Bangladesh did not change, basically did not change any kind of basic structural changes in the PCA or Pakistan citizenship in Bangladesh. So here we found that the historical legacy is that it is also accepting or forced to receive the people from the neighboring countries like Myanmar, particularly from 1971, as uh, from 1971, 1978, 1991, 92, 93, 94, and 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, after 17, the people from northeastern part of, western part of Myanmar, which is for Rakhine state, a huge migration took place, particularly the Rohingya people. Those were the Bengali speaking people in that country who settled long back, even before the beginning of the British rule. During the British rule, there was huge migration in the northwestern part of Myanmar, Bangla, sorry, Burma, or present is Myanmar in the Rakhine state. It was found they became majority in particularly in the border region between Bangladesh and Myanmar. So how they would be treated in Bangladesh, that became a serious problem. Whether they would be granted the citizenship to uh, these uh, uh, Rakhine people, to the people, those who migrated from the Rakhine state as called uh, uh, Rohingya, Many of them were provided temporary shelter in the refugee camps. Many of them were given shelter in the isolated areas. Many of them fled to India, and many of them are looking for shelter in different countries, either as third party settlement or as asylum seekers. So Bangladesh is also not free from the historical legacy uh, in its citizenship. There is another issue that is called the standard Pakistanis or the Bihari Urdu speaking um, Muslims, those who were pro Pakistanis and they were loyal to Pakistan even after the emergence of Bangladesh, they were looking for their Pakistani citizenship. That is why they were not accepted as a citizenship, citizen of Bangladesh. But very recently in 2008, the Dhaka High Court has um, declared that the people, those who are Urdu speaking, 
uh, may be granted the pa Bangladeshi citizenship if they desire to stay here for a long time. At the same time, the latest statistic of Pakistan, it said that it has received around 1,70,000 people of Urdu-speaking people from Bangladesh um, uh, who were either called the Muhajis, sorry, uh, Pakistanis or the uh, standard Pakistanis or the Biharis. Now, coming to the northern states uh, of India, like uh, the Bhutan, a very small country, which has received the attention of the entire globe very recently, because of the propagation of the idea called the Gross National Happiness, GNH, instead of Gross National Product. This country is also not free from the tension of citizenship, particularly in the post Second World War period. Very small country, the population is very less, even uh, it is only just 1 million people, not more than that. This country has received around 10% of its people from the neighboring countries like Pakistan, uh, India, as well as from Nepal. The Nepalese speaking people, those who settled in Bhutan, they gradually emerged as a strong force in the 1950s. But it was found that the, the southern districts of Bhutan, having border with India, the Nepalese speaking people gradually emerging as a dominant community that was not tolerated by the national community of that country. So gradually the Nepalese were identified as the uh, illegal migrants to Bhutan. So they were forced to register their names in the uh, government records in the act of 1958 called the Bhutan Nationality Act and later on in 1977 this is called Bhutan Nationality uh, Citizenship Act, 1977. And finally, in 1905, the Bhutan Citizenship Act, the new Citizenship Act of Bhutan, 1985, BCA, or the Bhutan Citizenship Act. This act has clearly stated that the people without having knowledge on the national language called Jonkha and without having any proof that they are living here before 19. 58 would not be considered as the citizen of this country. Moreover, uh, Bhutan had declared a policy called the Driglam Namja. It means uh, one nation, one culture, and one state. And the Nepalese speaking people, they failed to prove their Jonka identity. So there was the expulsion of these people from the small country and one Tenth, that is 10% total population of that country, they were expelled and they forced to take shelter either in India or in the UNHCR concert camps in Nepal. And finally, they had, uh, they have been settled as the third country settlement, particularly USA, Canada, as well as some European countries. And many of them have assimilated with the Indian population in Northeastern states, as well as in West Bengal. Now, this case is also related to the historical legacy. Now, I am coming to the concluding part because I took already 17 minutes. This, In the concluding part, I would like to say that the citizenship issue of India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka here, you will find the history of the conflict between the Tamils as well as the Silanese on the issue of their identity and the share of political power. And they are frequently coming to India. That is well known. I had, could not discuss in details here. So here you will find the issue that one is that the colonial background, even before a pre-colonial background or the history of India or Indian empires that flourished in different periods, either the Cholo Empire, the Pala Empire, and later the Mughal Empire, and later the British Empire, that had a kind of relationship with the people of the neighboring countries of India. And after the Second World War, with the rise of nation states, it was found the people or the all the countries of South Asia are mostly, all of them are plural in nature. So, Majority community gradually emerged as the ruling community, and many of the linguistic minorities or the religious minorities, they felt their life is not safe in the region. So they began to migrate from the place of their origin in order to take a better shelter. So migration took place either from India to Pakistan, 
Pakistan to India and from Myanmar to India in large scale after the uh, Second World War. And still now these forces are on. In such a situation, these countries of South Asia, they try to deal with the Citizenship Act. And here it has been found that the domestic politics of all the countries of South Asia is a driving force behind the amendment of the respective Citizenship Act to deal with the new challenges. So here lies the importance of the historical legacy in regards to the issue of citizenship while a considerable number have been left out from the recognition as citizenship. Many of them are branded as Muhajis, many of them have branded as standard Pakistanis, many of them uh, branded as infiltrators or as the asylum seekers. So without having the history of South Asia, the problem of the South Asian countries or the citizenship issue of the South Indian countries cannot be understood. This is the concluding part, and I think my uh, time is over. So with this word, I'd like to thank once again the organizer for providing me an opportunity to share the history of the historical legacy and uh, contested citizenship in South Asia with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. For your brilliant lecture. Uh, we got enriched and now this uh, paper is open to take questions. We will take two questions. If you have any questions, please. Is there anyone with a question? Sir, I think. Uh, there is no one with a question. So, yeah, no problem. Okay, sir. Thank you. And our next resource person is K. W. Chitramala Harangani. K. W. Chitramala Harangani is the museum officer at Onuradhapura Museum, Onuradhapura, Sri Lanka. Ma'am, are you there? I request K. W. Chittamala Harangani to deliver her speech. Ma'am, please go on. Ma'am, it's getting interrupted. Your voice is not coming. Can you hear me now? Yes, clearly. Please go on. Okay. Please kindly tell me how to share my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Uh, there is an option, a present now. There is a button, see? Present now. Please click on that button, present now. And then click on your entire screen. Can you see the option, ma'am? Present now? Yeah, it's uh, uh, Tarangini, ma'am. Uh, just below, right side of the below of your screen, you will you will see this present now option. Okay. And um, just just then, click the option. And then click on the. Okay. Uh, it's yeah, coming. Yeah. It, Can you see my sorry, presentation? Sorry. Yes. Yes. It's visible. yes. Okay.
Yeah, it's a sewing. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, all of you. Good afternoon, all of you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Assistant Professor Yajur Mitte and the organizers uh, for inviting me to uh, give you a lecture on punch mark coins found in Sri Lanka. Um, in here, um, I'm going to talk about the punch mark coins found in Sri Lanka, its origin uh, series, and also the trade connection between India and Sri Lanka. Uh, before going to talk about punch mark coins found in Sri Lanka, I would like to give you a brief introduction on epigraphic and literary evidences related to currency system and trade. Um, in, from the inscription, we can find uh, information on <coughs> coins, provisions regarding currency, trade kills. Uh, when we talk about the uh, coins or currency, we have evidence on uh, inscription like Kahavane, Kashapane, Kahapan, Kahavane, Kahavanu, Kahavani, Kahavan, Kahavane, uh, Kahane. These uh, words refer, denotes the currency of contemporary society. So in Sri Lanka, the earliest uh, inscription found uh, mentioned about the Coins, uh, coins and currency is Mahampit inscription, which is dated to the second century AC. In here, you can see it has mentioned Dwe Kahapane. Dwe means two. Kahapane is the currency of contemporary society. And also, we have found some inscription uh, like this with this symbol. So, scholars um, argue that this is the symbol uh, for currency. Uh, in that period. In also, we have provisions related to currency system like Badagarika is Badagarika means treasurer, Panadaka, superintendent of merchandise, Rupadaka, so, superintendent of the mint, Rupavapara, delay in coin money, Ayaka, revenue officer, Ganaka is uh, Dinar's uh, account. And also, these words, vanija, vanika, puga, puka, refers trade kills. Uh, in, furthermore, we have literary evidences on coins and trade uh, in chronicles like Mahavamsha, Tutuamsha, and Divamsha. So, let's talk about the Panchmark coins. I believe most of you have awareness about Panchmark coins as you have ample number of coins found from all, all over the India. So here I'm going to talk about the bunch of coins found in Sri Lanka. Uh, the earliest coin ever found from Sri Lanka is punch mark coins. Uh, the coins are dated to 3rd century BC to uh, 5th century AC in Sri Lanka. But in India, the coins uh, circulated from 6th century BC to 150 BC in North, North India. When it's come to South India, it's 3rd century BC to 3rd century AC. So you can see there is a time difference between India and Sri Lanka. India, I mean North India, South India, and Sri Lanka. Um, you know, the technology is punching technology and the weight is stand is 3.3 gram to 3.5 gram but in Sri Lanka we hardly find this type of uh, weight standards because of the long circulation period of punch mark coins in Sri Lanka. Please understand the 
chronic chronology and the series of white mark coins and the third is to reveal the extinct pattern of sri lanka uh, gupta and hardakar classification method was used for the um, this research as you all know that uh, the uh, classification uh, method introduced in 1985 was one, two, seven series, but in later on, 2014, they introduced actually Hardaker, Mr. Hardaker introduced uh, two more series, series zero and series eight for the original classification method. So this method was used to identify the origin and series or the chronology of the coins. So, Panchmark coins found in Sri Lanka have Northern Indian origin. There is no native Panchmark coins in Sri Lanka, according to my studies. And the coins belong to Imperial series, and the coins they circulated between 3rd century BC to 5th century AC. And uh, furthermore, uh, it could identify five series like series three, four, five, six, and seven, which dated to 400 BC to 272 BC. When we talk about the exchange pattern of Sri Lanka, why the Panchmark coins, which have North Indian origin, uh, yielded in Sri Lanka? Uh, all of, as you all know, the, Indi the Sri Lanka is located in the southern tip of Indian mainland. Uh, because of its central position in the Indian Ocean, it led to a uh, lot of trade connection with uh, Western world and also Eastern world and also with uh, India. Um, Indian traders played a major role in Sri Lankan maritime trade as intermediary traders. According to Bopiar, Professor Osman Bopiarachi, he said that the Western traders um, came to India by using uh, southwestern monsoon and, and they uh, wouldn't go to Sri Lanka because they uh, had a fear of uh, missing the east, uh, north east uh, monsoon uh, to go back to the, their, their motherland. So, South Indian traders came to Sri Lanka and they bought trade goods and then they sell uh, them to the Western traders in when they. Uh, Western traders when they arrived into India. Uh, when we talk about the archaeological evidences regarding to uh, imported trade goods from India, we have several pottery types and several beads types also. Northern black polish wear, red painted wear, red polish wear, black and red wear uh, have been uneven from Mandratva Citadel, Mandratva Gediki excavation, Godavai excavation, Pissamharame, and Akurukode excavation.
Hello, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Be. Okay. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. Please go. On. Okay, I was talking about the pottery types. Now, I'm, now I'm going to talking about. I'm going to talk about the beads type from in Sri Lanka. When you talk about the uh, materials of uh, beads. We have carnelian, amethyst, garnet, uh, and also calc, uh, glass beads uh, in Sri Lanka. But carnelian is not native to Sri Lanka. These uh, material come from India. And according to scholars, amethyst also come from India. We have garnets in Sri Lanka, but uh, three researchers uh, named is Stusa Siraj Arkop can have conducted the material analysis of six garnet beads uh, by comparing them to um, raw material from South India and uh, beads uh, from India. They conclude that the six beads, uh, the compositions of the six beads uh, a pair of six, six beads are um, similar to uh, beads found in uh, India. So that means these uh, uh, garnet beads come from India, not from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka in Sri Lanka, there is a famous uh, gem uh, mine called Ratnapura gem, uh, but uh, Ancient people haven't used uh, the uh, uh, these Ratnapura gem pit uh, for garnet beads. <clears throat> From Akurugur excavation, uh, we have uh, lock color beads, opaque brownish red glass beads, round tabular rectangular bead type 7, ellipsoid circular type 6, truncated barrel circular type. Two, uh, these beads uh, come from Brahmapuri, Bokhardan, Nasik, Ujjaini, Ahichatra uh, in India. Okay, um, from the Anuradhapura Gediga excavation, uh, we have found dark blue transparent glass beads, uh, which come from Mahit Chandra, Arikamedu, and Brahmapuri, and seeds of serial name Lachraima Jobi used as a beads in the Ahit Chandra regions. Um, Okay, then uh, let's move to the epigraphical evidences uh, regarding to trade connection with India. In Abhagini monastic site, we have an inscription, Illu Bharatahi Dameda Shamane Karite Dameda Gahapatikane Ashade Shagasa, and so on. So here, Illu Bharate means uh, merchant from South India, according to Professor Sudarshan Senviratna. Bharate means 
merchant from South India and Damida uh, Gahapati means uh, Tamil householder. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you see the screen? No, no, no. Okay, something has happened. Uh, I can't figure it out. Yes, now the is showing. Okay, so there's a there's a technical problem here. I can't, yeah, yeah. can't figure it out. Before uh, something going to happen, I'm going to conclude the presentation. So, uh, Panchma coins found in Sri Lanka have uh, North Indian origin, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are uh, five series. Uh, which are dated to 400 BC to uh, 272 uh, BC. And uh, the Panchma coins found in Sri Lanka uh, came as, as a result of uh, trade connection between India and Sri Lanka and the expansion of Buddhism and Jainism to the far south. First, uh, they might have come to South India and then they uh, come to Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you uh, for all listening to me. Thank you, ma'am, for your brilliant presentation. And uh, I'm sorry to uh, sorry for the disturbance. There is an error. I can't figure it out. No issue, man. No issue. It can happen at any moment. Uh, now we are going to take questions. Only uh, two questions to really take. The paper is open to take questions. Is there anyone with a question? May I ask a question? And are you welcoming question now? Yes, sir. Certainly, please. Okay. Please. So, so, just a question uh, to uh, Chitramala. Yeah, uh, good. Yes, sir. Good. It's a very good presentation, and you. Uh, you have brought uh, within a short time the whole punch mark coins of Sri Lanka. <laughs> yeah, it's good. But I just would like to ask you the question that you are talking about panchma coins yes. uh, as far my knowledge goes that i see panchma coins of india sri lanka's dates are um, contemporary right uh, madam uh, the series uh, panchma coins found in sri lanka goes yes. back to the third century bc and they were circulated until fifth century ac but in india in North India, where the Panchma coins were struck. So, so you were saying that, uh, just hold on, okay. Third century BC is a time when we have, you know, many places the Panchma coins is circulating. The circulation was uh, much wider in third century BCE. And, and you are saying that in Sri Lanka till fifth century, you are getting? Yes. Till fifth century CE. Yes. Uh, Panchma coins are uh, circulating. That means it is recirculating in the area, right? Yes. Yes, of course. Okay. So now again, another question is: Are you saying that, like, how you look at this? Uh, you are saying that it has come uh, first to South India and then to Sri Lanka. 
that means you are uh, talking about that the panchma coin from north india traveling to south india and then to sri lanka are you yes. saying that uh, because uh, in the south india they have panchma coins in 3rd century bc and in sri lanka we also have panchma coins in 3rd century bc okay uh, and also okay, okay. Yes, I got it. I got you because uh, the subject is mine. So I know it. Okay. But uh, I want to give you an information now. See, if you say that uh, 3rd century BC, we get in South India and we are getting in Sri Lanka. That means it is coming first to South India and then to Sri Lanka. I think uh, I don't agree with you this uh, phenomena because it is the third century BCE when we have a, a wider circulation due to the trade. Indian Ocean trade was getting, uh, you know, like third century uh, BCE when uh, much more trade is going on, much more wider circulation we are getting for the uh, circulation of money. Now, third century BC in Bangladesh in west bengal like the port sites all the port sites during the third century bc which are functioning in as you have shown the map in uh, indian map what i see that uh, during the third century bce our lower ganga valley in uh, west bengal uh, odisha uh, bangladesh even in myanmar thailand all are having panchma coins uh, during 3rd century BC. So you cannot just say that it has gone to South India and to Sri Lanka because uh, from North India, like from Bengal, we do have a direct contact with uh, yeah, Sri Lanka. It can go. If we uh, look at the looping network of the Indian Ocean Trade Network, then Sri Lanka, they can reach not only from south india but they can also reach, uh, reach from because uh, from as you see that indo pacific uh, glass beads are traveling uh, from sri lanka as well uh, during the time am i complimenting com, uh, complicating the matter i just want to understand uh, no uh, no no i i understand madam that uh... I uh, suggest that the coins uh, uh, might have come from come to South India and then to Sri Lanka. Might have arrived. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Am I audible? Hello? Yes. Yes. Um. Yes. Uh. I saw. Uh, in my presentation, I suggested that. Um, Panchmark coins first arrived in South India and then to Sri Lanka because in Northern India, they were abandoned their coinage around 150. So there's a time difference. Um, that's why I suggest and also in South India, we have uh, inscriptions uh, uh, mentioned about the traders uh, uh, come from Sri Lanka and also we have inscription in Sri Lanka uh, who come from in India. So these are the reason for the suggestions. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your uh, information uh, about being uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh. Thank you, madam. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, right now, there will be paper presentation. So we will start this session. And uh, this session will be chaired by Professor Ruth Kumar Bormon and Dr. Sanjay Mukherjee. Uh, Professor Ruth Kumar Bormon is the professor in the Department of History University, and he is also the coordinator of the Center for Ambedkar Studies. And Dr. Sanjay Mukherjee is an associate professor 
and HOD in the Department of History, Saldinga College. So I will request Professor Dukumar Gormon and Dr. Sanjay Bukharji to chair this session. Uh, Shobhan sir, just a minute sir. Just a minute sir. Shobhan sir, I am uh, Dr. Mukherjee here. Sir, you are audible. My network connectivity at my place just now is very poor. And it will happen uh, at any moment I will be disconnected. So, my, uh, I would uh, like to request Professor uh, Kumar Gormon, if I will be disconnected, then please continue and chair the session. Please sir. Okay, I am here. My connection is uh, stable. I think I will not be disconnected. No problem. But you, uh, uh, we if I will be disconnected. Yes, uh, yes, sir. I, I, I would like to request you if I will be disconnected, please continue uh, the session and chair the session, sir. Uh, because as because my connectivity in this area, in my area, is very poor. Okay, thank oh, you. I'm here. I'm here also with you. If I will be disconnected, then you will carry on. Okay. okay. Shomalo, one thing, how many speakers are there in this session? Uh, sir, in this session, uh, we have 11 speakers. 11 speakers, so 10 yes, minutes should be not more than 10 minutes we can give, is it? Uh, no, sir, uh, actually, uh, 5 minutes. 5 minutes, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's 5 minutes, and uh, after this session, there will be uh, the speak of Salvation person. And uh, she is Dr. Catherine and Butcher. And after her speech, uh, the session will once again be there. And uh, so in this session, we have 11 paper presenters. And I think Professor Malamando is not here. Next, our next paper presenter is M. Alankaro Mashinlamani. M. Alamsko Mokinamani. Are you here? M. Alamkaro Mokinamani. Are you here? I think she is not here. Next, in the is uh, Ariamal Sudar Kanan. Yes, sir. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, sir, I think I can yes. finish this in five minutes. You will get uh, five minutes. Oh, I will try my best to finish in five minutes. Thank you. Okay. My topic is uh, influence of Sanskrit tradition on South Asian culture. Let me read. Sanskrit is the classical language of the Indian subcontinent. Veda, the oldest source of integral wisdom, science, tradition, and culture of remarkable civilization of India, or the fundamental scriptures of Hinduism, is the primary stage of this language. And this stage of Sanskrit language gave birth to a vast and varied literature from epics and poetry to Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain, religious and philosophical texts, and scientific treatises on everything from astronomy and architecture to law and linguistics. Sanskrit tradition was carried outside the Indian subcontinent to adjacent regions which came under the influence of Indian culture, Tibet and China, to Southeast Asia from Thailand to Indian Asia. In Hindu tradition, Sanskrit language is the language of God. Today, Sanskrit continues to be the primary language of Hinduism. But ancient Greek has been for Greece and the Mediterranean world, and what Latin has been for the Rome and Europe, Sanskrit has been for India and vast section of Asia. 
but Sanskrit literature vastly exceeds Greek and Latin literatures combined and with more enduring resonance today. Sanskrit represents one of the oldest branches of family of languages known as Indo-European, which extend from India to Western Europe. There must be a notable influence of such an illuminating language on culture or tradition of India and also on cultures of other Asian countries. This paper is an attempt to spread light on the influence of this eternal language on South Asian culture using this methodology. Hinduism is an Indian religion and dharma or way of life. Sanskrit is regarded as the ancient language in Hinduism where it was used as a means of communication and dialogue by the Hindu celestial god and then by Indo-Aryans. Sanskrit is also widely used in Jainism, Buddhism and Sikhism. The ten Sanskrit is they are from the conjoining of prefix sam meaning samyak which indicates entirely and krit that indicates done thus the name indicates perfectly or entirely done in terms of communication reading hearing and the use of vocabulary to transcend and express an emotion an extraordinarily complex language with a vast vocabulary it is still widely used today in reading of sacred texts and hymns Sanskrit in terms of its literary association is classified into two different periods, the Vedic and the classical. Classical Sanskrit has its origin in the ends of Vedic period when the Upanishads were the last sacred text to be written down after which Panini introduced the refined version of the language. Panini's timeline is assumed to be the 4th century when he introduced his work Ashtadhyayi which means 8 chapters forming the only available foundational and analytical text of Sanskrit grammar. It is considered to be the only source of Sanskrit grammar and vocabulary today because everything that existed before had never been recorded except via their mention in Panini's Ashtadhyayi and which made this language most suitable for the modern computers too. Sanskrit had, has a major impact on other languages such as Hindi which is presently one of the official language of India and Indo-Aryan languages such as Kannada and Malayalam. It has impacted that sino tibetan languages with the influence of Buddhist texts in Sanskrit and their translation and spread. Telugu as a language is considered to be highly lexically Sanskrit which, from which it has borrowed many words. It has impacted Chinese language as China has picked up multiple but specific words from Sanskrit. In addition, Thailand and Sri Lanka has been enormously influenced by Sanskrit and have many similarly sounding words. The Javanese language is another which have been influenced by Sanskrit along with the modern language of Indonesia and traditional language of Malay spoken in Malaysia. Philippines have a minor influence from Sanskrit. Above all, English, the current modern international language has also been influenced by Sanskrit and has picked up many loan words from the ancient languages. For example, primitive from Prajin meaning historical, ambrosia from Amata meaning of, in, in food of God, attack from Akramana meaning taking aggressive action, path from Pada meaning road or way, man from Manu meaning a female, oh, sorry, male human, Nirvana from Nirvana meaning divine liberation, Door from Dwar meaning the doorway connecting two spaces, serpent from Sarpa meaning snake, etc. Since both are considered as Indo-European languages and only through this Sanskrit region the Indian culture will be determined. When Columbus set out to discover a route to Indies, he, had, he was not merely looking for the present day India, he was referring to the whole region of South and Southeast Asia. Until about 15th century, Indian culture was not just limited to the land of Yanjas, but was spread from Lanka to Sri Vijaya, Yavadvipa, Cambodia, the Cambodia, Ayutthaya, uh, the Thailand, uh, and Lanka. In the 14th century, most of South Asian, South Asia, Southeast Asia came under the Hindu kingdom. Hinduism came to the Southeast Asia in about 200 BC to the traders from Kalinga, the Eastern India. It was mainly con concentrated above, around Java and Sumatra, Indonesia and Malaysia. By around 8th century, they became completely Indianized, adopting Sanskrit names, Hinduism, adopting Ramayana and building Hindu temples. The name Indonesia comes from the same source as India, Indus River, as the Indians began to have a big influence there for or about uh, 1,500 years ago. Singapore is a Sanskrit word meaning the city of lion. Sumatra comes from the Sanskrit word from Samudra, meaning ocean. Java comes from the Sanskrit word Geva, meaning Bali. The etymology of Cambodia is a little controversial as it derived from the Sanskrit 
but kombucha kombucha refers to a iranian tribe who had no caste the brahmins called the cambodians who had no caste either as kombucha the word implies casteless barbarian both tamil and sanskrit had a big influence on southeast asian in terms as both south indian chawlas as well as north indian traders started establishing their cultural elements on these islands influence of sanskrit in buddhism there's one paragraph the chinese traditional culture includes uh, three systems uh, confucianism nihilism and buddhism the first two are chinese culture and the buddhism is introduced from india uh, indian culture extended to china through buddhist culture and sanskrit influences can be found in buddhist literatures pali sanskrit chinese and tibetan are the main sacred languages of buddhism among them sanskrit Buddhist literature refers to Buddhist texts composed either in classical Sanskrit in a register that has been called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit (BHS) or a mixture of two. Several non-Mahayana Nikayas appear to have kept their canons in Sanskrit. Most prominent among which was the Sarvastivada. The Mahayana sutras are also in Sanskrit, with less classical register prevalent in the Gatha portions. Buddhist tantra are the two are written in sanskrit sometime interpreted with abhyabhramsha and often containing notable irregularities in grammar and meter besides text considered word of buddha the buddha vachanas by the tradition that transmitted them buddhist authors have composed treatises and literary works in sanskrit dealing with buddhist philosophy logic etc but also with more worldly topics such as gemology erotic literary aesthetics etc sanskrit buddhist texts Uh, literature is therefore vast and varied despite the loss of significant amount of text the influence of sanskrit in jainism along with hinduism and buddhism jainism is one of the three hello. most ancient indian hello yes. hello madam uh, just yes. interrupting you uh, yeah uh, myself as riyazul midde i am one of the convener of this conference uh, due to some internet pro uh, network problems uh, uh, professor somal uh, is not able to con connecting so just you 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 have just completing your 5 minutes ma'am just 1 minutes you will have to finish yes i'm um, concluding the the name jainism in the from the sanskrit word itself the g verb g to konga it refers to the ascetic battle that it is believed jain uh, mom must fight against the passion and worldly sense to gain enlightenment or omniscience or purity of So, Jain literature comprises Jain agamas and subsequent commentaries on them by various Jain aesthetics. Jain literature exists mainly in Sanskrit, Magadhi, Pali, Tamil, uh, Malayalam, Tulu, and more recently in English. The agama is a Sanskrit word which signifies the coming of a body of talking by means of transmission through a lineage of authoritative teachers. They are believed to have been verbally transmitted by the oral tradition from one generation to the next. much like the ancient buddhist and hindu texts uh, many classical texts of jainism are in sanskrit example tattvartha sara puranas koshas and the mathematical texts and nikandus etc uh, in short asia is a continent with great linguistic diversity and is home to various language families and language isolates among these sanskrit is the uh, most ancient language uh, and sa sanskrit language gave birth to very vast and very literature in hinduism uh, jainism and buddhism and and there is notable influence of such an illuminating language in the culture of india as well as uh, in the culture of south and southeast asian countries thank you thank you so much so thank you very much well. uh, i think uh, is there any specific question to her in the chat box there is no question so far so i think uh, riyajul uh, you can call the second uh, speaker yes yes sir yes sir so sorry to uh, suddenly i stopped uh, i interrupted uh, with your permission sir uh, i am now going forward the session uh, and our next speaker is dr basubraj banokanahalli uh, are you here Doctor Basavaraj Banakanahalli. I think sir is not available. Uh, then uh, our next speaker is Basanta Barman. Uh, yes, yes, sir, I am here. 
Yeah, uh, uh, yes. Brasant Barman's uh, his his title of title of the paper is Ethnicity at Stake: Culture Cultural Crisis of Rajbangsis of Sub Himalayan Region of South Asia. Please, sir. Go. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I convey my virtual greetings to all the paper presenters. My heartfelt thanks to all the members of the organizing committee of this online e-conference organized by the Department of History, Shaldiha College, Bakura. I also convey my thanks to those academic dignitaries whose august virtual presence from various corners of India and abroad made this e-conference a gala event. And their valuable presentations made the, this e-conference quite different from an ordinary webinar that has become an academic trend during this pandemic period. I sir, once can again- you, sir, sir, sorry to interrupt you. Can you uh, unmute your video, sir, option? Oh, oh, okay, sir, okay. I once again convey my thanks to all of you. My topic for today's e-conference is Ethnicity at Stake, Cultural Crisis of the Rajbanshis of Top Himalayan Regions in South Asia. According to Indian census of 2011, more than 65% population belongs to Rajbanshi Khatriya community in the districts of Kuzbihar, Jalpaiguri, Darjeeling, North and South Dinaspur, and some parts of Malda, Murshidabad, and Birbhum in West Bengal. The number of population of Rajbanshi community figures more than 15 million in this area. Besides, Rajbanshi people live in Gwalpara, Dhubri, and Kamrup districts of Assam, Kishanganj and Purnia districts of Bihar, Jhapa and Morong districts of Nepal, and many districts of Bangladesh like Rangpur, East Dinaspur, northern part of Bogura, and northwestern part of Rajshahi districts. Though the Rajbangshi people live in various cross-border locations, they bear the same ethnic identity, they have same cultural heritage, and they have a rich language which the Rajbanshis feel proud of. But the greatest hazard in Rajbanshi life came during, the, during and after the Indo-Pak War in 1971. Indira Gandhi, the then Prime Minister of India, in her address in a conference of the Global Nations at Luxembourg, told that more than one crore refugees took shelter in India within the outbreak of war in the first week of December. Most of those refugees entered into the northern district of West Bengal, like Kuzbihar, Jalpaiguri, Darjeeling, North and South Dinaspur and Malda. When the war ended, they did not return to Bangladesh, but resided in India permanently. On humanity's ground, Rajbanshi people shared with them food and shelter and everything. But with the change of political scenario in the late 70s in Bengal, changed the attitudes of the refugees also. Overnight, the helpless refugees became all powerful cadres of the left parties. The left front government came into power and in the name of land reforms, they captured the lands of Rajbanshi people and distributed them to Bangladeshi refugees. The left government of West Bengal inflicted oppression, suppression and tortures on peace-loving Rajbanshi people. This uncanny political situation resulted tremendous frustration irritation and extreme anger among the Rajbanshi youths. And as a result of this, 
during the late 90s under the leadership of Jivan Singha, Kamtapur Liberation Organization or KLO was formed to resist and retaliate the oppression of the cadre of the left parties in the sub-Himalayan regions, Torai regions and Duarte regions of North Bengal. There came a political change in West Bengal again in 2011. In 2012, Rajbanshi Bhasha Academy was established in Kuz Bihar by the new government of West Bengal. Everywhere, there was a feel-good situation for the Rajbanshi people. But unfortunately, the real shock came in 2011 when Kamtapuri Bhasha Academy was established in Jalpaiguri and clearly there was an indication of divide and rule policy of the present government of West Bengal. Two language academies with different names for one language and that is the apple of discord among Rajbanshi youths now. And all these have been done for political benefit by demolishing Rajbanshi culture. In, 19, in 1898, George Abraham Grierson published his book entitled Linguistic Survey of India, which he composed after tremendous field survey throughout the Indian subcontinent. And on the basis of his survey, he made reports resulting the colossal book with 19 volumes. He opined that Rajbanshi language is a different language from Bengali. I quote from Linguistic Survey of India, Volume 1, Part 1, Page 153. Quote, when we cross the river Brahmaputra, coming from Dhaka, a well-marked form of speech in Rangpur and the districts to its north and east, it is called Rajbanshi, and while undoubtedly belonging to the eastern branch has still points of difference which lead us to class it as a separate dialect. It is spoken in the following districts, Rangpur, Jalpaiguri, the Terai of Darjeeling district, the native state of Kuzbihar, together with the portion of Gualpara in Assam already mentioned. We thus find that the Rajbanshi spoken by the following number of people, grand total 35,9171, unquote. But Mr. Griarshan told Rajbanshi language a dialect, and his opinion is crossed by Australian linguistic expert Matthew Tolmin who did his PhD in Rajbangshi language, I quote from Matthew Tolmin, an expert, excerpt, quote, other specimens of literature composed in the dialect which have been discovered, the Adhutajarja Ramayan, Chandika Vijay, Manushamangal, etc. To this list, we can add the letter written by coach king Naranayan, to the Ahom King Chukhampa Sargodev in 1555 AD. The letter has been claimed by scholars of Bengal to be the earliest prose specimen in the Bengali language. A claim which, however, begs the question of the categorization of Rajbangshi language as a dialect of Bengali. So, here I conclude my paper with the question that is Rajbangshi language is a dialect or it is a complete language? That is the question with an appeal to all the dignitaries to comment that the Rajbangshi culture is now attacked from various corners in various political, social and other corners. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Basanto, for uh, presenting an excellent paper on the uh, problem of the Rajbansis. But uh, I would like to just uh, give you an idea 
that uh, you must go through the proper statistics while presenting uh, the data. Uh, I don't know how did you calculate one point, 15 million residencies, and you have to remember one point that the residencies of the uh, the group and South 24 Perganas, North 24 Perganas are quite different. Uh, so that is a different issue that may be discussed. Now, the paper is open to the audience. Is there any specific, is there any specific question you can ask to Professor uh, Yes, I have a question uh, about the Rajbanshi. Uh, what are the relations of the Rajbanshi with the other tibeto birman tribes uh, for example, the Lepshas, the Limbus, the Rai, what are the relations with their neighborhood? Uh, actually, the Limbus and Lepshas, they belong to Nepali, or uh, they, they live in Darjeeling district, actually, or Nepal. And Rajbamsis live in Kosbiar, the plain region of the um, South Himalayan area. Yes. I know the, the Rajbamsis. I stay sometime in... Uh, Manaiguri and uh, Jaipanguri, Shiliguri, yes. and I met uh, the Rajbansi tribes, yes. Thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, is there any other question? We can take one or two more. Okay. So I think uh, we can ask, uh, now invite the next uh, speaker uh, for presenting his paper. Yeah, Julie, yeah. Our next uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Our next participant is Pashrati Mukhopadhyay. Pashrati Mukhopadhyay. Pashrati Mukhopadhyay, are you here? I think she is not here. Akash Kumar. Akash Kumar, are you here with us? Akash Kumar is not here right now with us. Then Aparna Vijay. Aparna Vijay. Are you yes. here? Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Okay, okay. Please go on. Good afternoon, everyone. Sir, am I audible? Am I visible, sir? Yes, yes. yes. Please go on. Yes. Thank you for inviting me, sir. Uh, I have taken the topic on uh, diaspora, Indian diaspora, and my topic is rootlessness and identity crisis, rendering an expression in the novel A House for Mr. Vishwas by B.S. Naipaul. Diaspora literature is a vast area which deals with literary works written by authors living outside their native country. In diaspora literature, themes like alienation, frustration, nostalgia, uh, then a dislocation, identity crisis, and rootlessness are being mentioned. Now, the writers of diaspora are sandwiched between the two cultures, that is the country that they are living now as well as the culture and tradition of their native country. So they are in between, their emotions are in between these two countries. The literature produced under these themes marks an emotion of dislocation and loneliness. V.S. Naipaul is one such expatriate writer who brought this diasporic sensibility to Indian literature. He's an Indo-Trinidadian writer who was born in London in 1932. His novel, A House for Mr. Bishwas, deals with the problems of identity crisis, dislocation, displacement, uh, the crisis, uh, identity crisis, frustration, dislocation of an individual. Mohan Bishwas is a protagonist of the novel, and we can find that he is continuously being uh, displaced, or he is, find, uh, he is having the problem of identity crisis continuously throughout the novel. And from his, we can see that from his birth till his death, he was facing this uh, directly or indirectly, he was facing identity crisis throughout. 
and uh, like one example is that he was uh, uh, he was uh, uh, I mean he was indirectly considered as one of I mean uh, one of the or uh, he was the uh, indirectly considered as the person who was responsible for his father's death and also his uh, birth was considered as ill omen because he was having extra finger and things like this so that shows uh, from birth he was not having a proper uh, a reputation or a good name and then it continues and we can find that after his marriage the main problem that he finds after his marriage was that the problem of identity crisis or a sense of belonging that is after he married uh, Shama and he goes to Tulsi house there it was a very different environment that is the Hanuman house uh, the laws of Hanuman house are totally different because uh, they, he understood that the men folk, they don't have, they didn't have any kind of voice. Their voices were not heard, heard, or their opinions were not valued. And Mr. Vishwas, uh, for Mr. Vishwas, this kind of uh, situation was very uncomfortable, and therefore he wanted, he struggles to create a space of his own. Um, that is by creating, I mean, that is by constructing a house. And for him, this house was symbolically a place where he can have his own freedom, his own uh, independent self, authority, and uh, yeah, the independent, you know, he can have an authentic selfhood. And um, from his, as I mentioned before, from his birth till death, he lives in many houses, and he's been continuously displaced through, uh, throughout. But he wants an accommodation for, for him, Shama, and his children. Now, he thinks that this house uh, this house, that is the house that he is going to build, uh, will be uh, representing uh, symbolically a knight, an independent self. He goes to Port of Spain with uh, uh, Mrs. Tulsi and he lives there as a tenant. And uh, he feels alienated and frustrated there, which in turn was questioning, uh, question, questioning uh, his identity. Uh, identity. And uh, then uh, Finally, when he found this, uh, the situation as uncomfortable, he tried to build a house uh, or he built a house near the Tulsi estate uh, in Short Hills. But uh, unfortunately, it didn't uh, stay longer because, of, because the house was destroyed in fire. And again, he becomes dejected and he was displaced. He was like, forced to displace. And then uh, Mr. Vishwas wanders from one house to another. He, um, and nobody welcomed him. And also, there was an instance where uh, he went to his mother, but mother also did not welcome him, uh, you know, happily. Now, he begins to live with an independent mm -hmm. life with Shama in Chase. So, in the part called as Chase, in the chapter Chase, uh, like, there we can find he being built, you know, he uh, builds a house and he started to live there. But, uh, again, unfortunately, he feels a lot of... Uh, you know, he is, uh, he feels the alienation. Uh, he was not really able to live there because of the feeling of alienation. He thought that living in Chase can be a solution to his problem of identity crisis. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And again, he feels a problem of identity crisis uh, with his loss of selfhood. Again, um, now, from this we understand that is he was in chase and he feels alienated and there was no and again he was facing as i mentioned before the identity crisis problem was there from this we can understand that uh, always that is uh, in in chase only shama and you know uh, this Vishwa's family was there and he feels he feels lonely and that shows that we can interpret in one way that is um, a society or a social environment is always required perhaps for a person to maintain his identity. And therefore, all of a sudden, a vacuum was being created around him. And that was the reason why he was feeling lonely. And a society, a society or a social environment is essential for a person. Uh, because each and every one of us is being interdependent to each other. And uh, Mr. Vishwa's happiness uh, lies in Shama and his children. And also, we can find in some instances he was again visiting uh, Tulsi house frequently. But for him, always a house means a place where he can have 
his own identity and freedom. No, as a man, he also wishes to be a person who will be, you know, whose uh, ideas and values and his, uh, you know, the, his words are being uh, you know, valued by people or uh, they have to be at least considered by people. But in Tulsi house or in Hanuman house, I mean, yeah, in Tulsi house, you don't, they, he was not having such an environment. They were just husbands. Whichever husband was like, it was a very large family. So who, whichever husbands come to Tulsi family, uh, definitely they were just husbands. They were not given any other uh, uh, kind of uh, privileges there. Uh, yeah. So then, so to conclude, Mohan Bish was, uh, you know, he proves to be a very uh, apt or a perfect example of a character who was being ruthless and was continuously um, was searching uh, for a sense of belonging or was continuously searching for this identity problem. Uh, in order to establish his identity, he was continuously being, you know, moving from one place to another uh, with his dream of building a house. Now, this no, this novel being uh, a semi-autobiographical novel, we can see traces of uh, V. S. Naipaul. That is, V. S. Naipaul's, uh, you know, his uh, his own life being interpreted here or being portrayed here, and also. Uh, V. S. Naipaul represent himself in a novel where emotions, nostalgia, displacement, and identity problems uh, comes into play. And also from uh, this novel, A House for Mr. Bishwas, we can we cannot conclude that uh, there was exactly a house that was there for uh, Mr. Bishwas as he dreamt. But uh, we can only say that uh, that uh, that dream was not fulfilled. So I conclude with these words that V. S. Naipaul, uh, a really great writer, has clearly brought the diasporic sensibility to this novel, uh, A House for Mr. Bishwas. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you, Aparna. It's an excellent paper that uh, you have focused on. Actually, diaspora literature is really a very vast subject, particularly with the growth of colonialism but, uh, from 18th century onwards, 19th early 20th century, there was the huge migration of people from the uh, Asian country, particularly India, that I had discussed in my paper also. And there was the uh, settlement of these people in different countries, popularly called the Caribbean countries that you are talking about, of um, House of Mr. Vishwas. Here you find not only V.S. Naipaul, I'm just giving one information, that it is not only V.S. Naipaul, his father, Sri Prashad, as well as his own elder brother, who died only at the age of 32, only perhaps you know, Shiv Naipal. If you go through his writings, a beauty contest, the contest between a Chinese and an Indian, how they became the part of their whole identity. Well, Mr. Gupta and Mr. Cheng, these are the two characters, the uh, story written by Shiv Naipal. Then uh, how the Chinese are trying to establish their identity in that country and how the Indian, Mr. Gupta, is trying to establish their uh, identity. All these things we find in the writings of this Naipaul family. At the same time, you'll find the history, a proto-history, a kind of history in their own writings, how they had migrated there and how they had tried to preserve the Indian culture in those kind of writings not only in Caribbean countries, but also in Southeast Asia, particularly in Malaysia, you see, uh, under Malayan government, around 25% uh, people of in, were Indian origin before 1956, though it has been reduced considerably at present. But at the same time, you'll find a different kind of literature is coming. So I think uh, this is an excellent paper. It is now open uh, for the audience, and you can ask any uh, specific question to Abarna. Thank you for the information. Okay, I think uh, we do not have sufficient questions at present moment. Uh, if there is anyone at the end of the session, we can... Uh, yes, uh, just... Uh, I found your paper really interesting, your presentation, and this uh, feeling of uh, home for the Indian diaspora living outside, the importance of the home, of the identity, uh, I think is uh, uh, is also correlated to, to this notion of uh, of nostalgia of India. And uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Yes.
our next speaker is Ritu Vishwakarma. Ritu Vishwakarma, are you here? Yes, I am here. Am I audible and visible? Yes. Please go on. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm Ritu Vishwakarma, Assistant Professor of History from Model College, Chapua, Madhya Pradesh. My topic is the influence of religion and philosophical thoughts of India on South Asia. South Asia. Our great Indian culture has uh, uh, influenced all over the world, and particularly the South Asia, because it is closely connected geographically with the Indian subcontinent. And uh, it was the part of Greater India and uh, the parts of uh, South Asia, uh, its countries uh, were the cultural colonies of India and maritime trade and imperial imperialistic policies of Chola and Pallava empires of South India accelerated the process of influence of India uh, on the countries of this area. And uh, uh, this process is called Sanskritization or Indianization. Uh, the influence of uh, Hinduism is begin from the Indus Valley civilization, the worship of mother goddess and uh, uh, Pashupati Shiva in all these countries, its tradition is prevailed. And uh, uh, in Vedic culture, uh, the philosophy of Vedas and uh, Upanishads are also influenced uh, these countries and uh, in Gupta period, the Hinduism uh, reshaped and transformed in the form of Vaishnavism and Shaivism and uh, the idol worships and uh, uh, <clears throat> temple architecture also influenced these countries and uh, <clears throat> uh, the deities uh, like uh, in Sri Lanka, the deity Murugan is worshipped uh, and this is the southern Indian effect uh, on, the, on that country. And uh, we see that uh, Buddhism uh, is uh, spread and became international religion by the emperor Ashoka and Kanishka. And uh, their efforts uh, uh, together uh, make the, this religion international. And uh, Ashoka himself sent uh, uh, his uh, son, um, Mahindra and daughter Sangamitra uh, to Sri Lanka to uh, deliver the uh, preachings of Buddha. And uh, in Nepal, there are many traditions uh, uh, that are influenced with the Indian culture like Gaya Jatra, that is the procession of cow. And Nepal is the impact of Vedic uh, religion because in Vedic religion, cow is considered worship worthy and it is called Aghanya. Aghanya means not to be killed. And uh, in uh, Nepal, the festival is uh, Dashin, is the uh, Indian form of Durga Puja. And uh, in this festival, uh, it, it is commemorated in the victory of Durga uh, over the uh, Jewel Mahisha Sura. And uh, the festival, uh, Nepali festival Tihar is like the Diwali festival of India and Fagu Purnima is like Holi of India. And uh, the temple Pashupati Nath uh, is one of the 12 Jyotirlingas and it is the influence of Shaivism of India. And uh, Sri Lanka is uh, closely uh, related with the great epic of Ramayana uh, of India. And uh, uh, Maldives, though it is a, a um, Islamic country, uh, but uh, historically, uh, it was uh, a remained Buddhist country for a long time. And 1152 AD, it became Islamic country. And its uh, folk dances are uh, inspired by the uh, Indian dance Kathak, that is Northern Indian classical dance Kathak. Uh, and uh, official language of Maldives, that is called Dhivehi. And this language has Indo-Iranian Sanskritic origin. And the term Dhivehi derived from the word Divi uh, of Vedic literature, and it means the island. 
in bhutan the death is considered the process of passing uh, one life to another so this is the uh, influence of uh, upanishad the principle principle of upanishad that is called the principle of rebirth and uh, in bangladesh the festival pehla baisakh is the uh, is celebrated on 14th april and uh, uh, it is uh, uh, synonymous to the indian festival novabarsh uh, that is celebrated by bengali uh, people and uh, um, afghanistan uh, was was the part of uh, uh, indian empire uh, mauryan empire uh, in the maurya period from the chandragupta maurya to ashoka and it is also influenced by india and uh, um, today uh, we see that uh, uh, india has uh, adopt india has adopted the culture soft uh, uh, power policy towards the afghanistan Uh, and uh, this policy is uh, mm, it means uh, uh, winning hearts uh, and minds through the art and culture and uh, because uh, uh, on the border of uh, afghanistan the pashtun path pathans uh, resides there and they are working as a buffer zone uh, to dissolve dilute the crisis of uh, india and pakistan so um, Uh, in uh, indian cinema uh, the bollywood uh, is very uh, popular in afghanistan and uh, in uh, indian cinema uh, pashtun pathans uh, are uh, portrayed as uh, very good guys and uh, they are uh, depicted as uh, very honest and friendly uh, in uh, uh, many films like chaliya and janji so uh, and uh, uh, influence of religio political political thought we can see the international organizations like uh, asian sarc and the panchashil uh, has uh, influence uh, over the world uh, international uh, foreign policy so um, and uh, uh, many uh, it is inspired by the buddhism so these facts uh, uh, are true indications that uh, india has much influenced uh, the south india and thank you for organizing committee of this international conference for giving me the chance to express my views and points thank you thank you ritu uh, bishakarma for your paper that you have presented uh, and try to identify the influence of indian culture in different countries of south asia you see there are basically uh, three or four type of roots you have to understand yes. this point and i am like to share not giving you more information yes. that starting from afghanistan to cambodia yes. if you go to the uh, roots you start from afghanistan and start walking straight towards or straight or through the himalayan route and then go to cambodia or vietnam Yes. you will find a similar culture this is a one kind of route and at the same time if you go to south india and then to sri lanka and then to some of the south east asian countries you will find a cultural similarity now at the same time if you go to uh, the uh, rajasthan and uh, having connection with uh, pakistan then baluchistan then to iran you will find a kind of cultural similarity at the same time the trade routes which my jan is there she can give more idea but you will find a different kind of roots by which the indian culture has spread in different countries uh, since the very beginning of ancient or the <coughs> ancient uh, culture in the ancient period then it continued in the medieval period and particularly with the under the colonial rule that i discussed in detail that how the different kind of states began to grow in the name of nation states and yes. with the growth of this nation state the countries are different but the root you will find a kind of similarity so that is why you will find all this kind of influence and this root that is called the contemporariness of the ancient culture in our recent times so thank you very much now this is open for discussion uh, sir uh, rup kumar barman uh, i have a, a little i just want to ask you one thing to have a clear idea about it because this is uh, the conference when i was just thinking all the time while even uh, i presented 
I had one um, question that we have similarities, right? So the yeah. cultural similarities are always, how can we differentiate the similarities with the influence? Because all the similarities, we won't say that's uh, influence. Uh, these countries uh, has not pure effect of Indian culture, but uh, uh, they, they transformed, uh, uh, the effect is transformed uh, by the uh, their uh, climatic and uh, geographical and uh, their cultural. Uh, yeah, that's uh, why, that's why. why. Uh, it's not pure uh, effect, but uh, some uh, uh, trends, uh, uh, strains we find, uh, find there. Yeah, but the similarities we have, as you were saying, the similarities we have due to our similar environment, geography, resources, and uh, similar uh, culture, right? And then we have certain influence, which we say uh, the influence, like this is not ours. Like, for example, the if the Middle East influence of Middle East coming to India, or influence yes. of China coming to India. So this that will be different. But when within South Asia, it's much more similarities rather than uh, the influence we see. And because we have the similar region, you know? And how Sar will uh, explain? Okay, uh, you are asking me? Yes, sir. Because yeah. I think yeah. you have explained the things uh, so that maybe you two and myself can okay. learn. Okay, I do not uh, have that much of idea, but what is my personal observation is that yes, this is a, a particular geographical region. In spite yeah. of a particular geographical region, there are different sub-regions. And within the sub-regions, there you will again find the local regions, and these local regions yeah. are very much influenced by the uh, ecological setup. And yeah, ecological yeah. setup in uh, particularly in Bengal, that is Bangladesh and in West Bengal and Assam, is changing in nature because of the reverend system. This is changing. At the same time that you have uh, properly identified that if you think about Nepal, you can't um, say that Nepal is different than India when Buddhism yes. began to grow. We cannot differentiate because right. that time this kind of national state was not there. As I told you, that this is the period of the different kind of rajas or the small states. Occasionally, some bigger empire that began to grow, like the Pala Empire centered in Eastern India or Bengal. Then you can say the empire of Harshavardhan. You can say the empire of the, uh, sorry, uh, the Guptas or the empire of the Mauryans. You will find their empire extended in different regions, not in the same India. But in Southern India, that uh, the Cholas and some of other um, uh, Rashtrakutas, the Pratiharas, they also establish their kingdoms or sometimes we say they are um, empires. Now, this was there. As Madam has really identified that when we be coming of Islam, a different kind of influence began to grow. And that led yes. to the formation of different kind of cultural assimilation. And this assimilated culture further uh, evolved during the British period with the coming of the another kind of Western culture or another set of exogenous culture, you can say. Yeah, which is not and ours. Yeah, that began to evolve further. And we have, yeah. suppose we are speaking in English, although we have our different kind of national or regional yeah. languages, but this is a common similarity. I mean, the, uh, for the convenience, we are using this because of this colonial rule. Now, after the end of the colonial rule, we have found that different national state grown up. And this different national state had a cultural root that is uh, ancient and started from the ancient period that began to evolve or evolution that continued in the medieval period, under the colonial period, it was further removed. Now, once again, in the post-colonial period or in the globalized world, we are again re being influenced by different mm -hmm. uh, culture, okay. our own as well as from the West. So in this way, you find this, this is changing in nature. But yeah. when we are presenting, uh, I think, uh, suppose Nepal now is a specific country, having the specific geographical region, Bangladesh having the specific geographical region, you'll find the cultural similarity between Tripura as well as Western... Yeah, Western the neighboring regions, yeah, neighboring areas. Yeah, you'll find uh, yeah. that um, the Rangpur division districts of Bangladesh have a cultural similarity with Lower Asham as well as from northern part of West Bengal. So these are there, but geographically boundaries are different. So that is the problem. I mean, uh, that is the background. That is my explanation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The similar opinion I have.
Thank you. So we can uh, invite you. Thank you. Very good paper. And, thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So I think uh, we can uh, now invite the next speaker. Yes. Well, uh, yeah. Our uh, next speaker is Dr. Lopamutta Moitko Bajpai. Our next speaker is Dr. Lopamudra Moitro Bajpai. Dr. Bajpai, are you here? Dr. Lopamudra Moitro Bajpai, are you here with us right now? I think uh, she is not here. Then Shindhu Shish. Shindhu Good Yes, what can hear you? Good afternoon to all. I am Sindhu CS, research scholar. First of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity. My topic is religion, uh, role of religion in Sri Narana Guru's philosophy. Sri Narana Guru possesses an eminent position in the history of India, especially in Kerala as a great saint, a seer, yogi, philosopher, social reformer, and an Advaiti. His non dualism is such that all the multiple isms, mysticisms, ethics, religions, and science merge in the unity of vision of reality. The enlightenment of the Guru that everything is one. On consciousness or Atman manifested as it were discrimination between human beings could not be tolerated caste, religion, God, ideology, language, or any other considerations. Guru's vision was all men are equal, unity, and universal. Here the topic dealt with the role of religion in Sri Narana Guru's philosophy. The insight of Sri Narana Guru's thought changed the whole human being into a single caste. He declared the gospel courageously, one caste, one religion, one God for mankind. It is to be visualized from two distant standpoints. One is the method of taking into account the common end of the happiness that all religions have as the central value embedded in, the, in their teachings. The second method is, is of the contemplative nature in which the such of beliefs and methodologies, etc., are brushed aside from the uh, for the sake of the higher value aimed at the aimed at by very every religion. Guru, both of these methods are observed in his philosophy, finding a unity ground. Etymologically, religion means to bend back. The word religion is derived from the Latin word re and leger. Dharma is corresponding Sanskrit word which means to hold or to support. Religions are a greater driving force in imparting guidance and inspiration to human, in, uh, human beings in general. In, uh, it encourages people to organize themselves into becoming productive corporations. The concept of religion, Guru tried to reveal the essential oneness of all religions. According to him, humanity is rooted in one single religion. The rivers merging from various mountains converge into the oneness of the ocean. So all religions merge into this single eternal object. The aim of all religions is to attain happiness. Sri Narana Guru uses the term Arava, Atma, Consciousness, Karu, and God to denote the own reality. This own reality alone is what religions refers, as, uh, refers to as God. It is when men feel the unavoidability, unavoidability of living consciously, relating himself with this reality, or the necessity of finding himself on with the whole, that religions find place in human life. Narayana Guru's concept of own religion is more clearly uh, stated in, the, in his work, Atmobadesha Shadagam, verses 44 to 49. The verses 44 uh, underlines the need for uh, taking a global view of religious systems. Comparative religion must tend to establish the point to uh, affinity in corresponding structural aspects torn out to the proper context or perspective. The total truth that is independent of particular circumstances and which should be limited even to correct particular items only tends thus to remain outside the scope of any particular formulation 
on complication of religious life. During the conference of world religious, uh, world religions conveyed by Sri Narayana Guru, he gave the uh, delegates the following words: "We are here to know and to let know, know to argue and win." A person wandering to know envisages the values of another man's vision. The essence of all religions is equally precious to those who have no hang-ups, uh, such as my religions and our uh, and your religion. The greatest common factor in all conscious and unconscious behavioral motivation is the search of happiness. Yogis seek kaivalyam. Jnani seek self-realization. Buddhist, Buddhist nirvana, the Christian so, uh, goal is salvation. The search of happiness is one and the same in all, at all times, in all the ways and everywhere. Coming to the conclusion, Sri Narayana Guru's religious teachings and messages have contributed a great deal towards the making of modern Kerala. So categorically, we can say that the Guru is the father of modern Kerala. Guru's religion excels in, be, uh, in being unity and scientific happiness in the golden thread of human values, which gives unity and meaning in the whole of life. The Guru not only presents here the happy prospects on one religion for all mankind, more than that, uh, more than that as each man to adopt this attitude that he could find peace of mind for himself and attain the goal of happiness. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Shindu CS. Uh, it is an excellent paper on C. Narayan Guru. Narayan Guru is well known, not only in Kerala, but also in entire uh, India as well as South Asian countries. He was born in such a community that was uh, not respectable at the beginning, but because of his our own efforts and continuity and giving uh, importance on the spread of education and cultural development. Kerala emerged as a very advanced state in India. Really, Narayan Guru Pratiparan Yagam, as well as different schools and colleges established by the members of the follower of Narayan Guru, led to the emergence of Kerala as an advanced state in our country and highly educated in technical, the technically sound state of our country. Now, uh, this uh, paper is open for the audience for the observation, comments, or questions. Is there anyone with a question? If you have question, you can ask. Okay, I think uh, Shomuslo, you can uh, invite the next uh, yes. presenter. Yes, sir. Our next speaker is Dr. Lanukumla Ao. Our next speaker is Dr. Lanukumla Ao. Dr. Ao, are you here with us right uh, now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am here. Okay, please go on. Good evening to the chairpersons and all the participants. I thank the organizers of the International E-Conference for giving me uh, this platform. I'll be presenting my uh, paper. Since No sound is coming. You are not audible, ma'am. Ma'am. 
maybe technical uh... okay she is trying to present it yeah let's see hello am i audible yeah. now am yeah, I yes audible? yes okay. yes right okay. now please, please continue and my slides can you view my slides yes hello? yes oh, yes okay yes. I, I am going to present on the topic management challenges of sacred groves in in Nagaland. In Nagaland, the history of sacred groves is well connected to the religious beliefs of the population. With changing times, the religious beliefs become less connected to nature in Nagaland, especially sacred groups are being neglected. This paper highlights the management challenges of sacred groves. The paper also examines the current status of some of the sacred groves located in Nagaland state of India. It also identifies the folklore associated with the groves. The research methodology for the findings of this paper is based on library researches and ethnographic field research. The cultural ethos of indigenous people in many parts of the world underlies their practices of the conservation of their natural environment. Indigenous people consider themselves to be connected spiritually to the biophysical environment. Therefore, the practice of nature worship by indigenous people gave rise to conservation of various elements of nature. Naga ancestors held reverential attitude towards nature and all of its life form wherein sacred groves are the potent symbol. Sacred groves of Nagaland have their own unique ethos. Without the usual temples and gods or cult objects, they are simply marked by stone, cave, stream, or pond in which a resident spirit or a keeper is believed to prevail. The local tribesmen used to offer, and even at present they still offer, sacrificial eggs, falls, pigs or dogs to appease the keeper in order to ward off ill omens and misfortune. Fear of the evil spirit and associated social religious tradition kept the crops from being exploited by human beings. Hunting, collecting of forest wealth and logging are strictly done by the owner, owners of the grove. Because of the limited time, I will just cite two instances on the sacred growth and the folklore that is associated with it. I selected uh, a district, Woka district of Nagaland. In Woka district lies Mount Teye, where spirit of the dead are said to wash their feet for the onward journey to the land of the dead. This automatically brought the place reverence and was conserved in olden days. However, unsurpassed elements are slowly encroaching and deforesting this precious catchment area. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in the same uh, district, we have Liko Invo or unclean land and it lies at Yansipo and is known owned by a clan known as Tanglao, who believe that a spirit resides in pond, which causes negative consequences to people in the area. Therefore, the area is left uncultivated. Management of sacred groves and sites through the traditional local system is now being challenged by number of economic and social issues, thereby, rendering traditional methods of management less effective. 
The main reasons for the destruction has been the rapid decline in the traditional values, values system and the various demand of population growth, which has obviously endorsed deforestation. The, the advent of Christianity also destroyed these values and religious beliefs. Unfortunately, in the case of a relatively small state like Nagaland, there are signs indicating the change in the sacred groves. The groves had and are fast eroding. If the religious beliefs associated with the sacred groves and traditional wisdom contributing to the forest production could be protection could be suitably integrated with the modern scientific forest management practices, these sacred groves could become a very useful model for biodiversity conservation in the region. In conclusion, I want to bring about this data. The total land of a total land area in Nagaland is 16 lakhs 57,000 588 hectares and one lakh uh, 334,500 hectares are covered by forests. Out of this, the state government controlled only 11.7 percentage and 88.3 percent is under the private ownership. It is quite clear that the private owners have the key role to play in the matters of the forest conservation, forest or the sacred roof conservation. So the management of the sacred groves also directly relates to the local people here. It therefore becomes vital to show the responsibility of creating general awareness among the people. This will hold a very important key to preserve history, heritage, ecology, and the future. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Nalanu Kumla Ao, uh, for presenting a paper on the sacred groves of Nagaland, which is sacred groves are the essential feature of the Northeast Indian states. As far as I have visited the states like Nagaland, Manipur, Meghalaya, Arunachal Pradesh, Asham, and Tripura, it has been noticed that the sacred groves are there in almost in all states of Northeast India. And they have a very close social, political, and cultural and religious uh, relationship with the local people. And they have a very significant role in the economy, culture, as well as politics of all these states. So now this paper, as uh, uh, presented by Landukumla Ao, is open for the audience for observation, comments, and questions. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, do you think that uh, I am a specialist of Sikkim? I did my PhD in Sikkim, and I follow my research in Sikkim. And Nagaland is a very interesting uh, state. Uh, do you think that uh, they the tribal groups of uh, Nagaland, uh, uh, by preserving their environment, try to evoke uh, consciousness of the protection of their uh, identity? Yes. If only we preserve or we could conserve these sacred groups, then our identity, our identity will also be preserved. And at the same time, the heritage of the state, of the people, will also be preserved in this manner. Thank you. Yes, it is true. Yeah, thank you, sir, for the question. Okay, is there any other questions? Okay, perhaps uh, there is no question at present. So I think uh, we can ask the, invite the next uh, paper presenter. No, sir, uh, this session uh, ends here. We uh, don't okay, have... Okay, uh, okay, So, so uh, this, he, she was the last paper presenter, okay. Now, uh, Dr. 
Sanjay Mukherjee. Okay, Sanjay is here. Sanjay, you are listening. Sanjay. Yeah, yeah, I am here, sir. Okay, okay. Now first you uh, uh, observe your um, present your observation, then I will conclude the session. Okay, sir. Uh, it is about to end here. Just a uh, two-day international e-conference. Uh, we have to uh, end uh, in a short while. What sir? It's a Herculean task to wrap up to wrap up all these papers. But I think uh, we have uh, in this session just one, two, three, four, five, six. Six papers already have been presented by the paper presenters. If I am not wrong, so uh, sir, uh, first of all, uh, the papers are presented by paper presented by Ariyamol Sudarshan. Uh, she was speaking uh, on languages and different countries. And you, uh, in the meantime, you have already discussed all the papers. Uh, so there are uh, no uh, such way to uh, uh, throw light on uh, those papers. And after that, Boshant uh, Varmono speaking on cultural crisis. And he told about uh, uh, Rajigunshi community's language, whether it's a dialect or, la or a language. And uh, uh, for a few years, uh, uh, almost uh, seven years, I was in Kujbihar in Tufanganj. Uh, college, uh, so I have uh, very much uh, closed to uh, that community and many friends of that community uh, of uh, mine is uh, uh, now also at present also. And after that, Okorna Vijay, uh, he was talking about India's uh, Indian diaspora, uh, rootlessness, and identity crisis. Uh, uh, on West Nepal, and you uh, said, uh, Professor Rukum Barman said, uh, throw light on that uh, on uh, literature uh, uh, and sensibility. Um, a sandwich of culture, uh, just like uh, this. And after that, uh, Ritu Vishwakarma, in, uh, on, uh, uh, he, he was talking about influence of religion and philosophical thought of, uh, thoughts of uh, India, of South, uh, South Asia, um, and Hinduism, uh, and uh, such uh, like that, uh, something like that. And uh, Sindhu CS, uh, she was also talking on role of religion in uh, Sri Narayana Guru. Uh, and his philosophical uh, and modern uh, philosophical uh, philosophy and religious teaching uh, to to uh, to build up a modern Kerala and uh, also Professor Bormon also to uh, throw light on that topic and after uh, that uh, the last uh, paper presenter uh, Ao, uh, he was uh, she was she was presenting his her paper on management uh, of challenges of the sacred groups in Nagaland that was a very interesting uh, paper. And after that, uh, it's a Herculean task. And sir, uh, I, I would like to request you to wrap up this uh, this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sanjay Mukherjee, for uh, giving the idea. Now, I will take two or three minutes, not more than that, because there is another session, I think. Uh, now, we have we got a few papers in this session. All the papers are really excellent in terms of their content and uh, the way of presentation and the thing they try to focus on. I have found basically three types of papers here. The first type of papers are two, Aryamal uh, Sudarshana and uh, Ritu Vishakarma. They try to focus on the uh, language, influence of language or the spread of language and culture, including the religious philosophy and literature, how they are associated with uh, the culture of South, East Asia, South Asian countries are associated with the language like Sanskrit, as well as the ancient cultural tradition, including the philosophy. So uh, we have already discussed about that. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Jahan was also with us. She has also left her observation on that issue, how these are related. Because of this, the historical legacy, we cannot deny that historical legacy is really important for understanding the language and culture of South Asia, as well as South East Asia as uh, Aryamal Sudarshana and Ritu Vaishwakarma, they try to identify. Then we have found another type of paper which are related to the uh, uh, so-called uh, ethnic communities as well as the uh, process of cultural change in among them. Here, three communities you can say. First is called the Rajbanshi community, which is truly now international community. Uh, here I like to add three sentences or four sentences that these community are now distributed in three or four countries like India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and some of them are also living in Bhutan. But in Bhutan, their number is very, very less, but they are mainly concentrated in India, Bangladesh, and Nepal. 
and their cultural change is uh, diverting towards three directions in bangladesh bangla language or bengali language is the primary attraction for the people and on the basis of this this is called national language it has been clearly stated in the constitution of bangladesh that bangla or the uh, bangla bhasha is the national language of this country so the people are more or less have accepted the bengali language they are not giving extra importance on this kind of language although in local level this culture is very much there i frequently visit bangladesh in northern parts it is said now that people are practicing but as a national language this is a very significant one bengali nothing about assam those who are living in assam and northeast indian states they are try they have adjusted with the language of that state in case of assam this is a assamese language though the south kamrupi language is more or less identical with the walpariya language or the language uh, kamtapuri language or the rajbongshi language whatever there is a kind of cultural similarity now think about nepal in nepal though it is a language as per the records of the government but the national language is different so in this way you will find a kind of crisis the in the broader perspective not only that people have come from bangladesh and settled down in the northern district it is not only that issue because the people from bangladesh have migrated other parts of india also other parts of west bengal also that kind of issue is not there so only the migration is not the fact the fact is that the distribution and the rise of national states in different way now regarding uh, the question, uh, paper of uh, on narayan guru it is an excellent one it is the best example in india how the human being a group of people can do many thing for a particular region particular um, area or particular part of the south asian countries the narayan guru uh, it is a kind of revolution so we cannot do that kind of revolution but it is a kind of social revolution in in case of kerala it is an excellent example that how narayan guru had created a kind of sense among the people those who were subjugated by the state and other forces and this is how a kind of revolution taken place that was focused by um, uh, sindhu gs and the similar uh, is called the sacred groups this is very excellent one it has been found the sacred groups are closely associated with the identity okay it's right but at the same time the sacred groups are being protected naturally because of this uh, kind of uh, uh, business the people are uh, the sacred groups have a very significant presence in the mind the lifestyle and culture of the local people and they are trying to protect their groups as well as their identity and these groups are obviously important important for the ecological balance which is really lacking in different countries now the third group of paper that i have found in the writing uh, in the paper of aparna that is an excellent one as i have already discussed that this kind of literature is coming up because of the spread of uh, because of the migration of people in different way in different countries and they are settling they are after centuries after centuries and they are trying to remember how was their life in their ancestral home and they are trying to um, come up with their new issues in the new land and trying to adjust how uh, they can be treated and what is their identity what is their culture here i am trying to i, I like to share one sentence that the bengalis in america they try to organize different kind of bengali festivals to gather the bengali speaking people whether the pronunciation is right or wrong that is not the issue here shukumar rai's poem sunte galam posta giye tumar naki mayer biye not mayer biye so it is not important the important is that they are practicing shukumar rai one of the best example of the bengali uh, literary personalities so this is the issue the question is the belongingness that is coming up in this kind of writing so uh, here i like to conclude that all the papers really excellent as well as try to focus truly international in character and on the south asian issues as a whole which are also connected with our global society as a whole so thank you for uh, giving me uh, this opportunity for sharing this session and interacting with you i uh, hope in future we once again meet not in the i hope i want to meet directly not in the google meet i think uh, within one year we'll be able to do that thank you once again 
an organizer for organizing this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your insightful observation. We've got a lot. Thank you, sir, once again uh, for chairing this session along with Dr. Sanjay Mukherjee. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And Thank you. we have Dr. Catherine N. Butcher. Uh, Dr. Catherine N. Butcher is from UK. She was born and brought up in the United Kingdom. She is an alternative educationist and her workplace is St. Lucia, West Indies. Ma'am, we are happy to have you here with us and I will request you to deliver your speech. Um, thank you very much, Sue, but just, just one correction. <laughs> Can you hear me? I was born and bred in St. Lucia okay, and, okay. And, worked, and worked in the UK, yes. Okay, okay. okay right. Um, a pleasant good day to, to everybody and um, to all presenters and to our viewers. Now, before I was asked, can you see me? Can you see me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You're okay. Audible. Okay, before I was asked to speak on this topic, I always had accepted the Indian diaspora in the Caribbean as our very own, which they really are. But I never took the time to understand the history behind this richness of the Indo Caribbean culture because I grew up having them around. So I would like to sincerely thank Assistant Professor Bine Barman from the Department of History, Saldiha College. West Bengal for extending this very kind invitation for me to be a resource person at this e-international conference. I also thank the other conveners and the organizing secretaries for this very interesting conference topic on the theme, International e-conference on Indian influence on South Asian culture and heritage. Now, as a Caribbean national, I will be speaking on Indian influence on Caribbean culture and heritage. And um, I would like to share my screen with you. Um, can you see my screen? No, no ma'am, not yet. Yes, it's coming, it's coming. Okay. okay, good, thank you. Okay, so, right, so just to provide a brief background, East Indians have been integral to the history, culture, and heritage of the Caribbean for well over 180 years. Following the abolition of slavery in the British West Indies in 1838, a large number of Indians were brought to the Caribbean by the British West Indian plantocracy as indentured laborers to work on the British sugarcane plantations for meager wages. So you could see here, um, here where they, um, they are coming in, some of the Indians are coming in and where they're working on the plantations. Right, now approximately 396 so Indians- So sorry ma'am, the video is, video is not visible now. It's sorry? Not, your presentation says it's not visible at this present. It's not visible? No, 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 it's not visible. Oh God, um, I'm wondering what's happening. Oh gosh, um, okay, let me start again. Oh gosh, um, wow. I do not know what went wrong there. Um, present now your entire screen. Um, I'm gonna share. Can you? Um, okay, just now, sorry. Yes, uh, sorry. it has come. It's come, okay. Okay, yeah, you see? Yeah, it's clear. No, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. Okay, so where do I continue from? Were you hearing me originally? We are here, we are here. You can continue. Okay, so approximately 396 Indians were the first set of laborers to arrive by boat in Demerara, Guyana, Many others were transported to different parts of the Caribbean in subsequent years 
with Guyana, Trinidad, Jamaica, and Suriname. And here we have them. Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, they receive the largest numbers. And um, also Jamaica up here. Now, most of the Indian immigrants yeah, were received by these larger countries while the smaller numbers were distributed around the smaller islands. So the smaller numbers went to islands like these islands around here. Now, now it was not only the British that participated in this type of commerce, but according to Samara, the French joined this lucrative trade in 1853, bringing in large numbers of indentured laborers from Pondicherry, which is the French colonial settlement in India, to settle in the French Caribbean islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe. So Guadeloupe, Martinique, and also French Guiana is somewhere down here, but it's not shown on the map. Now, the Dutch also brought in the fair numbers. So the Dutch brought in persons who went to these islands here as well. Studies have revealed that approximately 2 million Indian immigrants settled across the Caribbean between 1838 and 1928. Now, the majority of Indians who came to work in the Caribbean West Indies originated from East India Uttar Pradesh, Western Bihar, and Calcutta in the Bengal Presidency, later renamed Bengal Province and Gujarat. A smaller number came from Afghan, Nepal, Panjubi, Bengali, and Sri Lanka, but most of the um, Nepalese went to Trinidad and Tobago. Now, following the indentureship, a number of immigrants returned to India based on the contract with the host governments. Some from the smaller West Indian islands were able to move off the estates and settle in communities in Trinidad and Tobago or Guyana, where the concentration of Indians was larger. So you see here in Guyana, Trinidad, Suriname, you have the larger numbers when they're and in where and in which they would be able to practice and maintain their Indian culture and heritage. Those who went who wanted to remain in the Caribbean were also offered land by the respective governments in the colonized territories. Those who did not have the finances to return to India or to move to the two larger Caribbean islands where the Indian diaspora was more heavily concentrated remained in the smaller Caribbean territories and they became integrated into the larger African Creole culture. Now, because of the shortage of female Indian immigrants at the time, Intermarriages took place between the Indian male immigrants and the native women in the Caribbean islands, thereby starting their own families and eventually increasing their numbers. So you will notice this is the current population of um, the, the Indians in most of the Caribbean islands. The Indian farming community grew because most of the farmers, um, most of the Indians who came in, they were farmers originally, and many sent their children to study abroad, where they became doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and accountants. So today, the influence of descendants of India is very discernible in Guyana, Trinidad, and Tobago, and um, Suriname, as I mentioned before, as they are the largest ethnic groups. Indians are also the third largest ethnic group in Jamaica and represent the wider Asian um, community. But because of the population of Jamaica, which is almost 3 million, although a large number of Indians went to Jamaica, but they only represent about 3% in Jamaica. Now, influence on the Caribbean culture. The Indian diaspora have integrated into the economic, political, social, and cultural fabric of Caribbean nations. And as such, the influence has been felt at the highest level of government. Descendants of the native Indians. Can you hear me still? Hello? Yeah, ma'am. Oh, yeah, ma okay. We are hearing, but not visible the presentations. Oh, why? I can, I can, I can, I can see. I can see. No, okay. the presentation we can see the screen. Oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. But now so you have 
sorry. Now you have Hello? stopped sharing. You not hear me? Yes. We can. Mommy, your presentation was visible. But your screen, you have stopped, right? Why is my screen stopping? I do not know why um, it's stopping. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Okay, yes, your screen has gone off. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm trying to come back on. I do not know why it's doing that. Um, okay. Um, I'm having a serious problem with the screen. Okay, I'm coming back on. Um, but no, I am seeing you. Oh, okay, because she said she wasn't seeing the presentation. <laughs> okay, all right. So descendants of the native Indians who arrived in the Caribbean. In the Caribbean. Yes, we are here, uh -huh, right. Have retained their distinctive heritage and culture, mainly in the larger territories like the Republic of Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname, while also functioning in a multiracial socio-cultural context. Indian movies, Indian music, and Indian cuisine have entered the mainstream culture of these territories. Now, chutney music and chutney soca, for example, is an Indo-Caribbean genre of music that has been very popular in Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Suriname, and Jamaica, and has found its place in Trinidad and Tobago's Calypso during the annual February carnival season. Chutney is a mixture of Bojipuri music and local music, and the name was derived from the Indian condiment because of its very spicy and a bit musical tempo. The popularity of chutney music has grown and it is being performed in other parts of the Caribbean diaspora. So um, these, as you could see there, these are the Indian persons who have won the um, Trinidad Carnival so far with the chutney music. Now, now, in Guyana, Indian music and Indian movies are played widely in homes all over the country. I lived and worked in Guyana for a number of years, and this is where I got a full appreciation for Indian music and Indian movies, which were being played regularly in my different neighborhoods. Indo-Guyanese descendants or Indo-Guyanese are the largest ethnic group in Guyana, comprising about 40% of the population, according to official um, census. And the largest, the second largest is the Afro-Guyanese descendants of African slaves. Now, Hinduism is the dominant religion of the Indo-Caribbean, and it has largely influenced the religious culture of Trinidad and Tobago. Guyana and Suriname, where the concentration of Indian diaspora is largest. Several Hindu temples can be found in these islands as well as a number of Hindu schools. Islam is also widely practiced in these countries by Indo-Caribbean and the influence on these islands are noticeable by the number of mosques and Muslim schools available throughout in the smaller West Indian islands. So these are some of the, the mosques and schools um, and Hindu temples. In the smaller West Indian islands, like my native country, St. Lucia, for example, most of the Indian community have converted to Christianity, abandoning the Indian Hindu heritage. People of Indian descent are an ethnic minority in St. Lucia, comprising only 2.5% of the population. Now, there is also a very small community of practicing Hindus in St. Lucia, as well as the other small islands in the West Indies. The Indian diaspora of St. Lucia has been campaigning to keep the Indian heritage alive, and they have been holding talks with the government for declaration of an Indian arrival day to commemorate the day when the first Indians arrived in St. Lucia, which was May 6, 1859. In Trinidad and Tobago, the Indian influence is very strong. Many streets, towns, villages, settlements are named after Indian cities and Indian people, such as Bombay Street, Calcutta Settlement, Nepal, and Bangladesh villages. The biggest, most significant Indian influence on the entire Caribbean culture is the traditional Indian foods on the Caribbean cuisine. For example, you have okra's roti, eggplant, spinach, curry, the famous curry, dalpuri, pilau, rice, and bitter melon, or karela, as it is known in India, 
are used widely in Caribbean homes and restaurants. Dalpuri is a favorite among the Rastafarian community, and there is the Jamaican famous curry goat. Also chutney, polori, dal, and chana masala are commonly prepared and eaten in Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, and Suriname, and enjoyed all over the Caribbean islands. Of course, um, roti is one of my favorites. East Indians also brought their re religious festivals to the Caribbean, and the Pagwa, Diwali, the Hindu festivals of color and of light are celebrated annually and continue to influence the culture of Caribbean countries with a plurality of the Indian population. Indian arrival and Indian Heritage Day are national holidays celebrated in these countries, Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, and Jamaica, in recognition of the contribution of Indians to the social and economic development. Indian Arrival Day is also observed by many other Caribbean nations as an annual public holiday. National Councils for Strengthening Cultural Relations and for the Preservation and Promotion of the Indian Culture have been established in Jamaica, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, and Suriname. Now, the traditional Indian wear are popular at Indian weddings in the Caribbean, religious ceremonies, and Indian festivals. However, they are not very common as everyday use, although you will find um, a few people wearing them, but they're not um, so popular. Now, Indo-Caribbean descendants have been very influential as prominent lawyers, jewelry shop owners, renowned doctors. Many have dominated in politics and in government at the highest level throughout the Caribbean. And here we will see these um, here are presidents from Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago and the prime ministers of Trinidad and prime ministers of um, Guyana and also Suriname. And he, um, Dr. Shridhar Ramphal, who is also from Indian descent, he was the secretary general of the Commonwealth um, Secretariat, which is um, based in um, the UK, but he is a Guyanese um, by birth. So in sports, there have been national legends in West Indies cricket like Shiv Narayan Chandapal, Ram Naresh Sawan, Rohan Kahini, Alvin Kali Charan, who have captained the West Indies cricket team, as well as many others who have excelled in different sporting activities. So in conclusion, the influence of the descendants of East Indian immigrants on Caribbean culture and heritage have been profound and have been felt throughout the Caribbean, whether it is in the foods, music, movies, or political influence of the government of the day. I thank you for this opportunity. Hello? Thank you, ma'am for your brilliant presentation. And uh, now we will take questions. If you have any question, you can ask. Is there anyone with any question? It means that I was very clear and very effective. <laughs> I think uh, there is no one uh, with any question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for yeah. being with us. We got enriched a lot. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, there will be the last session of our paper presentation. And this session will be chaired by Dr. Soylen Devnath. I will request Dr. Soylen Devnath uh, to join us here. Sir, are you here? Yes, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, I will request you okay. to share this session.
uh, because uh, some participants are there and they are going to present their papers. And uh, the participants will get uh, five minutes each. And uh, sir, in okay. Little... okay, sir. Okay, uh, sir. Uh, should I proceed? <laughs> sir, are you ready? Should I proceed? Sir, maintenance of time should be with you. Okay. I now request uh, the participants to present their papers. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Our first participant is Amit Kumbhakar. Actually, I think it's a joint paper by Amit Kumbhakar and Somnath Kaur. Amit Kumbhakar, are you here? Hi. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Good evening. Please go on. You have five minutes. Uh, I am uh, audible. Yes, you are audible. You have five minutes to present. May your I audible, paper. please? Okay, thank you. You thank have five you. minutes to present your uh, paper. Respected, uh, okay, thank you. A respected chairperson uh, and uh, organized uh, committee and co author uh, Somnath Kaur and all of you present here. We are uh, sincerely. Thanks, Professor Binoy Bormon, for giving us a chance to present our research paper. Today, our topic is South Asian Santali culture. South Asia is home to uh, more than 1.5 billion human representing uh, many diverse such as ethnicities, linguistic, and religious groups and representing almost one quarter of human. In her, the Santals are one of the largest groups of Adivasi people with their rich culture and heritage in South Asia. Now, uh, ethnic groups of South Asia. South Asia, which consists of the nations of India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Maldives, and Sri Lanka is ethnically diverse with more than 2,000 ethnic groups of people with a population ranging from hundreds of millions to small tribal groups. Main ethnic groups of South Asia on the basis of language is Indo-European peoples, Dravidian peoples, Austro-Asiatic peoples, Tibeto-Varmish peoples. Now, uh, research questions and objectives of present study. In this, course, in this paper, we have so many research questions and objectives. Uh, number one, who are the Sautals? Number two, their origin and early history. Number three, location of Sautal in South Asia. Number four, key element of Sautali culture in South Asia. Number five, similarities and dissimilarities of Sautals and their cultural diversity in South Asia. Number six, a government approach and plan to uplift Shantan and their rich culture in South Asia. Number seven, influence and the present cultural condition of Shantan in South Asia. Now, research methodology. To fulfill the research study, both primary and secondary data are used here. Primary data collected uh, from many district gadget here, census report and other government report. Also, uh, co uh, conduct interview with Santali people in India and abroad uh, by telephone. Secondary data collected from various books, journals, uh, newspapers, and online sources. Now, uh, location of Santal in South Asia. They are mainly found in India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan of South Asia. An estimate population figure of Santal in South Asia, which is uh, provided by Dr. Dhuni Shoren in his uh, Adivasi and Santal in South Asia. In India, 10 million, Bangladesh, 2.5 lakhs, Nepal, 70,000, Bhutan, 5,000. Also in Pakistan, Myanmar, and other smaller uh, countries have smaller number of South Al but it is uh, difficult to find even the estimate figure. Now the origins and early history of South Al 
in this case, the main uh, problem uh, to uh, properly trace their origin and early history is uh, lack of written document and uh, such evidences. Uh, it is uh, accepted and agreed um, by the most anthropologist and scholar that Shantal is a name given by non shantal people. Uh, even the Shantals among uh, called themselves use the uh, term Hor, which means uh, human being. Uh, regarding the origins of Shantals, uh, we have uh, various opinions in this case. Uh, opinion, uh, according to uh, introduction to grammar of Shantali event by uh, the uh, Reverend L. O. Shakespeare, uh, that they lived in Persia, Afghanistan, and Tanzania, and entered India from the north. West and settled in the Punjab after they migrated to the uh, area. Another opinion, uh, like Colonel Dalton, I believe that the Santals came from Northeast India and uh, found their way to the Surnagpur uh, Plateau and uh, the adjoining highlands uh, by the line of their scared stream, the Damodar River. Uh, in uh, support of this theory, he cited. Uh, a certain remarkable coincidence of uh, customs sorry, and language sorry, between the Southerns and some. Sorry for interruption. You have yes. one more. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the key element of Southerly culture, uh, as for uh, B.S. Kuha and Tianan Zodrai, the Southerns are classed with uh, proto astrology Second, uh, traditional village organizations. Uh, the hierarchy of the officials is a British Maji, Pramanik, Jog Pramanik, uh, Godet, Naike, Kum Godet. In Pargona, Sardes Maji is the man uh, of all. In my uh, concrete part, the Santal uh, are earliest inhabitant of India, then they migrated and settled in various South Asian countries. Uh, second, uh, the Santal uh, managed and preserved their cultural heritage through their language, Santali, uh, religious uh, beliefs and customs. Uh, number three, uh, socioeconomic conditions uh, comparably differ from uh, various uh, countries. Uh, number four, uh, government approach and facilities comparably differs in uh, South Asian countries. Uh, uh, number five, uh, in, in fact, uh, South Asian culture and um, through a long continuity with a uh, uh, rich and uh, cultural heritage. Thank you. OK, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Hello. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yes, uh, this paper seems to be very nice, uh, covering uh, nearly all the aspects of the Shantals in India. Uh, uh, I thank uh, the speaker, Umit Karmukar, for taking up this topic. But I'd like to request him regarding the origin of the Shantals. Uh, the uh, theories given by uh, the, the European thinkers during the colonial period should be treated very cautiously. And they think uh, all the time that as if things, uh, people to have migrated to India, in most cases from outside, they uh, told, told about the migration of the Aryans from outside. But nowadays it is more or less proved, though not widely accepted, that the Aryans might have been the original inhabitants of India. The same way, uh, the ideas are there that uh, he mentioned about this uh, Persian origin and Northeast Indian origin, this and that. So many theories are there. But I think uh, whether they are original inhabitants of India, autochthonous people of India, this part should be nicely explored and expositated. Otherwise, the paper seems to be very nice, but the aspect, the impact of Shantali culture, culture on India and South Asia. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I uh, say something? In detail. 
Thank you, Sarah, for giving me a such suggestion. May I say something, sir? Hello. No, no. May I say something, sir? Uh, in no, this no. case. That 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 is that is no scope. Sorry, sorry. There is no scope of further discussion. But I say that uh, you have developed it nicely, but take a little bit caution in some cases, and more interest in some cases, and uh, try to collect. Uh, uh, the highest amount of uh, materials and documents in order to prove the origin. So, thank you. Is there any question on the paper? Uh, thank you. Any question, please? So, okay. Sir, I think uh, there is no question on the paper. And... Uh, okay, okay. The next... Uh, but I think uh, yeah. Amit wanted to say something. Amit, uh, Amit oh, hello. wish to say something. Uh, yes, due to a please. short time, we uh, cannot uh, discuss in the, uh, anal analytically, uh, but uh, we have uh, so many uh, Santali uh, creation meat and folk tales, uh, which is uh, survived uh, orally uh, from one generation to another generation team now. So we, uh, we can uh, find uh, many uh, uh, evidences uh, that provide uh, their origins and early history. But uh, due to uh, short time, uh, we cannot present that. Hello. So, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, our next participant is... Hello. Next, yes. Our next participant is Ramodit Farkar. And... Ramojit Sarkar, uh, I must say that Ramojit Sarkar is a first semester undergraduate uh, student. He has taken honors in history and uh, he is a student of Haldia College, uh, Department of History. He is going to present his paper. Ramojit Sarkar, are you here? Please go on. Yes, sir, I am here. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity to present my paper titled Influence of Rama and the Ramayana in Southeast Asia. The Ramayana is a popular ancient epic of India, and Rama is the hero of the epic, who is regarded in Hinduism as an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. The Ramayana, first written by Valmiki, has been translated and rewritten many times in India and many other countries. With the growing connection between mainland of India mainly the southern part of India and the countries of Southeast Asia. Through trade, invasion, and other mediums, the story of Ramayana was also disseminated in these countries. The people of these countries have loved the epic and its characters, and they have adopted the story and rewritten it in their own style, own language. From the royal house to the small church cottage, the Ramayana story has become popular with all. For instance, in Thailand, there are at least six kings who wrote the Ramayana in Thai verses. In Malaysia, the Jari Husmanta Ramayana is popular as the Hikyat Sri Rama. In Thailand, the Jari Husmanta Ramayana is known as the Ram Kien. And in Laos, the popular Jari Husmanta Ramayana is the Palak Palam. The characters, plots, and origin of characters have also been changed. For instance, in the Khevai Thurapi, a Laotian version of the Ramayana. Rama was in the son of Dasaratha. He was son of a brother of Dasaratha. In this version, Rama and Lakshmana were the cousins of Ravana, Vivishana, Indraji, and also the cousins of Balin and Sugriva. Sita happened to be the daughter of Ravana, who was abandoned in her childhood and was adopted and grown up by a sage. In most versions, Anuman becomes the son of Rama. Rama is projected many times as a person who has many wives or maidens, including Sita. It is important to note that Ravana is upgraded from his demonic form and becomes a handsome, beautiful man in the Latin version of Falak Falam, where Rama becomes stranger. Ravana becomes a true hero in this version. The Ramayana has a wide and great impact in the architecture, paintings, literatures, arts, songs, dresses, would have a society, and even in their personal lives in the countries of Southeast Asia. There are many temples and buildings where the episodes of the Rama story have been carved. For instance, in Myanmar, 
there are 347 English cultures on the episodes from the Ramayana and Mahalaka Marajayin Pagoda in Upper Burma. I also want to specially mention the 29 murals describing the story of the Falak Falam on the walls of Central Hall of the Bhat O Mong in Laos. Besides the Kikari version of the Ramayana, many oral versions of the Ramayana have been popular in the countries of the Southeast Asia. In these countries, oral versions of the Ramayana have remained popular mainly as tales and from the tales of professional storytellers. Many common people have also crammed the story of the Ramayana. I want to mention the one term version of the Ramayana of Malaysia here. In Thailand, the Ramayana is staged in the form of Nan Yai and Khon. In the Nan Yai, characters of the Ramayana are made with pieces of skin and they are beautifully painted. Each character is joined with two sticks. The characters are projected on screen from behind and the version of the Ramayana is recited by the scholars. Thus, we can conclude that the Ramayana is still loved by the people of countries of South and Southeast Asia. And the Ramayana and Rama has become a part of their life, culture, and tradition. Thank you. So, thank you, Ramoji Pishwaka. Uh, your topic is so vast because Rama himself was an oceanic character living in fact the river and still it is continuing. So the topic is very vast and you have tried to keep some instances. Anyway, the influence of Rama on India, South, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, all these are very much exemplary. And I think in course of time, if you develop the paper further, and you can also write one book on the influence of Rama uh, on the Asian cultures. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Our next speaker is Shoma Dash. Shoma Dash is also a student of the Department of History, Shaldia College, and she is from third semester. Shoma Dash. Yes, Good evening, everyone. I am Soma Das, BA third semester in history honors, a student of Saldia College, Saldia, Bakura, West Bengal. Now, I am present my the seminar topic is the Kali, the symbol of um, power and empowerment in South Asia, women empowerment. The word Kali is derived from the Sanskrit word Kala means time, stone, day, death or black. The origin of Kali may be traced to the duties of the village, travel and mountain culture of South Asia, who were gradually appropriate and transformed. It never quite tamed by the Sanskrit tradition in our Indian culture. She is known as Devi Mahamaya. The chief character features of Kali iconography, cult and mythology, commerce related are not only with date but also with sexuality, violence, and paradoxically, in some later tradition, with motherly love. Kali worship all India, but particularly in Kashmir, Northern India, Southern India, Kerala, Bengal, Assam, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, etc. It is interesting to note that some scholars of USA have seen Kali as a symbol of feminine empowerment, while members of New Age moments have found theologically and sexually liberating inspiration in her more violent sexual manifestation. The Hindu goddesses, a unfairly popular positive figure of feminine power on the political representation of women in two countries where Hinduism is the religion of the majority. India and Nepal to speak of places is actually the Hindu Panther includes a member of clans who are conventionally divided into two man categories. Begin goddesses and fair goddesses, repetitively characterized by set of features such as the character, appearance, ability, kingship, resilience, worship, pride, etc. But the deity referred to as the goddesses is most often either Kali or Durga, who both 
are without control and unworthy. Consider the Sokti, i.e., the topic feminine principle of power in South Asian countries like power. Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the goddesses. Kali is much popular and it is the Sokti of power and destroy the evils. It has a great impact in our lives. She is not only a deity, but also she has an important role in our daily life. Origin of Kali, different type of Kali, symbol role of Kali in women empowerment. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, your topic, in fact, uh, is really serious. Uh, and now I think you haven't yet come up to the stage of uh, learning about this in detail. Uh, you can read one book, Shokti and Shakta, by Sir John Woodruff. And in that book you will find what is the meaning of Kali, how it is worshipped, and in what way Kali is related to the the evolution of the universe, that is Shiva and Shakti. Shiva, in fact, is consciousness. Shakti is energy. These two things being combined together, in fact, gave birth to our concept of the Godhead. Anyway, uh, for you, I think it's a really uh, a topic, uh, very difficult for you, I think. You try to develop it in course of time, because it has deeper roots in Indian religion, Indian spiritualism, and uh, so other aspects of our culture. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now our next speaker is Shantanu Laik. Shantanu Laik. Shantanu Laik is also a yes, student yes. in the Department of History, Shardia College, and he is a third semester UD student. Santanu Like. Yes. Good evening, sir. I am Santanu Laik, student, B honors, Department of History, same three, Saldia College, Saldia Bankura, West Bengal. Now I am present my seminar topic is India's contact with the Western world. It is generally agreed that India had contact with the Western world before the Christian era. The discovery at Mohenjo-daro so that there was intercourse between India and the Western world in about 3000 BC intercourse, was by land as well as by sea. Greece, the invasion of India by Alexander of Greece was the beginning of the intercourse between India and Greece. Several Greek historians wrote about India. The subsequent invasions also lead to greater intercourse. Afghanistan. In ancient times, the region of the south of the Hindu Kush mountains up to the Indus River was an integral part of India. It constituted a province of India in the Vedic Age, Mohiran Age, and the Kushan period. The Chinese travelers Fa Hian and Hian Sang, who visited India in the 5th and 7th centuries, respectively, called Afghanistan as a part of India. The Roman Empire plainly tells us that half a million sterling plowed every year from the uh, from Rome to India to pay for the balance of uh, trade during the first two centuries uh, after it. This statement of uh, Pliny is supported by the large number of Roman coins which in India. The foundation of Alexandria by between Egypt and India. There was direct voyages between these countries. It is stated that in the 6th century BC King, Darius deputed Cyrus to explore the Indus Valley. He slid down the Indus River to the Indian Ocean and ultimately reached Egypt. Sir Aural Stein, who explored the Gobi Desert and uh, Kotan, um, found old 
It is said that Buddhist monks first came here during the reign of King Ashoka to seek discovered at Damian and Vigram in Afghanistan so that these two towns were once great centers of Buddhism in ancient times. A huge statue of Buddha creeps out of has been discovered at Banyan. Any problem? I think there is a technical glitch. Yes, yes, yes. I am complete my topic. Shantanu has completed, sir. Oh, yes, completed. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, this paper, though he is just a student, but uh, it's also very vast because the Indian contract with the Western world is really very vast in the sense that even in the 6th century BC, mm -hmm. it is presumed that Pythagoras came to India and his very concept of Pythagorean theory most probably was derived from the Indian. Another theory is that the Indian teachers had taught him in Egypt, where he was uh, for a long time to study. So this is, in fact, a very long history. Around the, uh, Aristotle also had a very good idea of India. Aristotle had advised Alexander to take some philosophers from India to Greece. So this is one thing, and the other point you task, that is, uh, spread of Buddhism to Middle East. This is Bactrian the Greeks. Most of them became the Buddhists. And among the Greeks, there were some Buddhist priests. And one was Dharma Rukshito, and the other was very important, Maha Dharma Rukshito. And even Nagoshan was a Greek, one who, in fact, uh, uh, converted to this uh, Minanda, King Minanda, to Buddhism. So this is in fact a very vast study. You can go through one book as you are a student. That's why I suggested Sarvabhulil Radhakrishna, his book, Indian Religion and Western Thought. These also may help you to develop your idea further. So thank you. Thank you, Sat. Our next participant is Saurabh Mishra. Saurabh Mishra a student, is a student of uh, third semester. He has taken honors in history and he is a student of Saldia College. Saurabh, please go on. Saurabh, you are not properly audible. We can't hear you. Saurabh. Yes, sir. Second network. Go. Hello. We are not getting your words. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Yes, right now. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Good evening, everyone. I am Soram Mr. Dear Thad Sim Stoners. Student of Saldia College, Saldia, Bankura, West Bengal. Now I am present my seminar topic, Greater India, Impact of South Asian Culture and Heritage. Greater India, its meaning, the spread of Indian culture. Outside India, in the countries of Southeast Asia, is often called a rest greater India. It is as well as the Matsapur, the past time for it. Glimpies of India, in the West and the South West it covers larger area on account of land as well to the east when no two Indians at that time have evidence not audio at all for, for interruptions 
Hello? Hello? I think there is a very poor connection. Shoura? Yes, yes, yes. Can you hear me, Shoura? Hello, sir. Sir. There is a network problem. So I think uh, we should proceed to the next uh, presenter. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Our next participant is Chandan Barmon. Chandan Barmon, uh, he is also a student from Shilcha. Chandan Barmon, are you here? Chandan Barmon, are you here? I think uh, he is not with us. Next speaker is Meghali Borua. Meghali Borua. Meghali Borua. Are you here? I think she is not here. Dr. Jitesh Roy. Dr. Jitesh Roy. Are you here? Dr. Jitesh Roy. Jitesh Roy, are you here? <laughs> Dr. Jitesh Roy, are you here? Okay. Dr. Roy, please unmute yourself. Dr. Roy, please unmute yourself. You are here. I am watching you. Please unmute your microphone and uh, speak. Okay, Dr. Jitesh Roy is here with us. Some problem? I think, uh, yeah, we, we, we have him. Actually, in the list, we can see that uh, Jitesh Roy is there. But uh, I think uh, there is a technical oh. problem. There is a glitch. And uh, I doubt uh, whether uh, he can hear us. Dr. Jitesh Roy, can you hear me? He is with us, but uh, he has not unmuted his microphone. Yes. Dr. Jitesh Roy, can you hear me? Please unmute your microphone. Please unmute your microphone, Dr. Jitesh Roy. Okay. I think there is a technical glitch and we are sorry for that. Now, Rajeshwar Roy. Rajeshwar Roy, are you there? Rajeshwar Roy, are you there? Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Sir, I think uh, there is a technical problem, and uh, okay. Chandan Barman, okay. are you there? Meghali Borua, Dr. Jitesh Roy, Rajeshwar Roy, are you there? Okay. Here, here, I will uh, request uh, Dr. Uh, Riyajul Mikbe uh, to announce uh, for the certificate and uh, that uh, feedback form. He is about to announce that.
I will request Sheikh Riyadul Mikde. Are you here? Okay. Before coming to that, uh, sir, hello, Dr. Shoyan Deka, sir, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Then, uh, sir, uh, I will request you to conclude this session and uh, share your uh, expert comments on the papers presented by the participants in this session. Sir, please go on. Uh, I think uh, after each paper, as I told you something, and all these are presented by students, so we may and not expect too much from them. I think that they participated and they wanted to share their views. That is sufficient. So I like to thank all of them and for their prosperity and the good for their well-being can be coming. Uh, I request them to read more and more to develop more interest in history if they like to become historians. So here I conclude and I also thank all of you uh, for selecting me to chat this session. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you. Now, uh, I will request Sheikh Riyadul Midde uh, to announce uh, for those uh, certificates and uh, that feedback form. I request Sheikh Riyadul Midde to announce for the certificates and that feedback form. Are you there? I think he is not with us right now. So with this, uh, we have come to the end of today's program. And now we are going to vote of thanks. There will be this vote of thanks. And it will be delivered by Mr. Vinoy Barmon, assistant professor in the Department of History, Shaldia College, Bakura, West Bengal. Now, I am requesting Mr. Binoy Barmon. Good evening. It was a really illuminating experience that I enjoyed throughout the day. I want to thank Dr. Sheikh Shirajuddin Honorable Principal of Shaldia College, Dr. Suresh Kumar, Director of Indian Council of Historical Research, New Delhi, Dr. K. Mahali Rajan, Assistant Professor of Ancient Indian History, Culture and Archaeology, Vishwabharati, Professor Shanaj Husne Jahan, Director of Archaeology, Bangladesh, Dr. Olivia Tyron, Burdu University and Sanjay Prashad, uh, Associate Professor of History, Tantra Centenary College, and today I thank to Professor Gamini Ranasinghe, Professor of History and Archaeology, Sri uh, Jayavardhanapura University, Dr. Shailen Devnath, Associate Professor in the Department of History, Alipur Dwar College. Professor Rukumar Barman, Professor of History and Coordinator of Ambedkar Studies of Jadapur University, Shankar Kumar Das, uh, Associate Professor of History, Bankura University, K.W. Chitramala Thangani, Museum, uh, Museum Officer of Onuradapura, and uh, Sanjay, uh, Dr. Sanjay Mukherjee, Associate Professor of History. Salvia College, Bankura. In a way, we are enriched. I want to thank the organizing secretaries and the team of technical assistants and IPC of Sinamala College, Jorhat, and IPC of Nandolal, Borgoy City College, Dibrugar, Assam. Thank you, everyone. 
We thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Sana Jusil Gahan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I'm very happy you are present today. Hello, Vino. Bye. Thank you. Vino e Bormun. Bye bye. Bye. Good. Hello. Bye. It was wonderful. Hello. Hello. Now you Hello, see. Hello, Vino. Yes. This is Sanjay Prasad. Yes, Sanjay Prasad Saji. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Thank you, Excellent. Dr. Baban, for your kind invitation to this international conference. So, leave her. Yes. <laughs> so, try to be in touch with us. Sign out, ma'am. Yes, please. Yes, I will try to. Yes, I will. I hope okay. to come back okay. to you. Okay. Uh, Congratulations <laughs> must be given to Professor Binoy Vormon and his team for organizing this extremely ornamented e international webinar. Hello. I am, I am from Punjab. I want to congratulate all the organizers, all the organizers. It's a really a very special I want to congratulate all the organizers. It is very, very impressive, innovative, and very possible. Thanks for thanks for providing us. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you. 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 Thank you.